You are now listening to Testimonies with Terry. All right, everyone. Well, I am super excited because on today's episode, I'm talking with Jason and Shannon Wright. Guys, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Terry. Appreciate it. Thanks, Terry. Super excited to be here. Yeah, we met briefly at the Remnant Youth Retreat in Tennessee this past summer. Uh, I, I don't know if it was Jana or Denna or the both of them that had you guys come and speak to the youth about your guys' story. And I was I, I was blown away. I, I immediately was like, okay, I have to find these guys afterwards and talk to them, invite them to come on my podcast because we got the Cliff Notes version of your testimony, which was super powerful. And I was just like, okay, I, I want I want the full full course meal here, right? Like I want to go into this. And so, um, yeah, super excited to hear both of your guys' individual testimonies. And then we'll go into your guys' testimony together as a couple. And guys, everyone listening, be prepared to be blown away at what God has done, because this is uh, nothing short of his amazing grace that you guys are still here together. And so Shannon, let's, let's start with you ladies first, right? So Shannon, talk to us a little bit about where did you grow up and what was family life like for you as you were growing up? Yes. Yeah, so uh, first of all, appreciate it, Terry, for having us on. We're very honored. It was great meeting you a few months ago. Um, yeah. John and Casey are great folks. So we appreciate it. They've connected Amen. us with a lot of a lot of people um, that are struggling in their marriage as well. So we appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so of course, Shannon Wright, uh, born and raised in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1980. So I'm an old lady. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, my, my dad worked for General Motors. Uh, my mom was a lunch lady at the school. Um, and um, I grew up in a home that... Um, we did not know God. God was not part of our life whatsoever, uh, but we lived with um, financial blessings for sure. And so I had a lot of um, a lot of money growing up, but not a lot of love. So right off the bat, Jason and I come from two very different backgrounds in that. And of course, he'll get into his testimony in a little bit. But um, I was an athlete. I love sports. I lived for sports. That's what kept me grounded because uh, I was a little bit of a rebellious kid. But um, growing up in a house that um, had money, but not a lot of love, I just, I searched so much for, for the love that I was missing because um, we have a hierarchy of needs as a child growing up. And a lot of those needs were not filled in the home that I lived in. So I continued my whole life just searching for happiness. Um, and the abuse that I lived in, it was nothing was ever good enough. Um, I would, like I said, I was an athlete, so I would do really good in a basketball game, say score 20 points, but that wasn't good enough. I should have had 30 points. You know, it was, I was trying to reach this um, approval level that I would never uh, reach no matter how hard I tried. And so years and years and years of this growing up, I just, I just gave up and said, forget it. I'm just going to live for myself um, to make myself happy. Whoever that hurts in the process, I'm, I'm going to live for me. And um, I always have been drawn to church. It, there was always a drawing. Like, I just thought, if I go to church and, and I believe in God and I don't rob banks, I don't steal from people, I don't murder anybody, I'm good, right? I'm good. I don't, I, I'm going to go to heaven because I believe in Jesus. But, you know, people being raised in a, in a Christian home, they're like, well, you know, of course it's easy, you know, believe in God and have a relationship with Jesus and go to church and live a good life. And it's easy, but when you don't know, you don't know. And I just didn't know. And I didn't have anybody to disciple me and, and saying, okay, the, the preacher that preached today, this is what the message meant. So I would just go to church listening to the message. And I thought, well, I'm good because I went to church, right? But as I got saved and grew closer to the Lord as an adult, I realized it was a relationship and, and not a religion. Yeah. So fast forward um, to my early teen years, I continued searching for happiness through guys I dated, um, alcohol, smoking. Um, I would steal because I was looking for that next quote unquote high. Because when you grow up in pain and you don't know how to deal with the pain, you learn to mask it because you're just trying to get through the day. Um, one, one example of, um, abuse that I experienced, um, was I was hungry. We did not eat until my abuser wanted to eat that day. So we would wake up real early in the morning. We'd have a bowl of cereal. And then by lunchtime, 
Um, of course, I was I was a growing kid. I was 10, 11, 12 years old and I was hungry. And so I continued to tell them, um, I'm hungry. Can we eat? Can we eat? But see, they weren't hungry yet. So it wasn't time to eat until they were hungry. So they got tired of me saying that over and over. So they took all of the food out of the cupboards, the freezers, the refrigerator, every, every edible thing in the house they put on the table and I had to eat it. And they said, eat all of this. And if you throw that up, you're going to eat that too. And so unfortunately I had to eat that too. And it just continued this through my whole childhood. Uh, when I was 18 years old, they um, tackled me, got me on the ground, choked me, slammed my head against the floor over and over, said, I'm going to fucking kill you. I'm going to fucking kill you over and over and over. And again, that just hardens someone's heart because if it's their, it's, it's, it's all they know, it's all I lived in every day. And so when you get that every day, then your heart starts to harden. And again, you put walls up and you say, I'm going to protect myself so nobody else can hurt me. And so again, that was out, that was throughout my whole childhood. I never got any help for it. Um, and then I brought that into our marriage. So fast forward to, um, and these are just little snippets. Again, I have, um, for anybody that would want to read my entire story, I wrote a book, My Story, God's Glory, A Story of Redemption. Um, it's on Amazon. And that, that gets into more detail um, of everything that, that really happened. Um, so I met Jason in April of 2001. Um, my sister, she was living in Nashville. And I went on my uh, spring break to visit her for the week. And I was dating a guy at the time uh, for five years when I met Jason and he was a great guy and treated me really well, but I just knew that he just wasn't the one for me. I, you know, I don't know, like we'd go look at rings and I'm like, ah, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm kind of uneasy on this, you know, but I thought, well, maybe she's, I'm young and you know, I'll, I'll get used to it, but I just never really got used to it. So when I met Jason, um, on my spring break of 2001, I just, right when I met him, I, it, there was an instant draw to him. Like it was an instant connection and we didn't even know each other. We just said, hi. I think it was the Southern draw. I mean, <laughs> that is true. Cause you know, being from Michigan, we didn't have any kind of Southern draws. And so when yep. he said, hi, I said, hello. <laughs> yeah. I think Shannon, we, we kind of bonded there uh, a little bit in, in Michigan. We're both, you know, Midwest people. And, you know, I, I think yes. I made the joke that it's not bag, it's bag, right? You know, right. you gotta, got to really draw out those A's. <laughs> That's right. Bagel. It's bagel. Yes. Yep. He teases me about bagel. <laughs> but, um, so I, when I met him, you know, it was just an instant connection. And so, course but we're 600 miles away you know and i'm like well, th this is never gonna end up being anything so he was a physical education teacher and i was going to school at grand valley state university in allendale michigan to be a physical education teacher so we already had so much in common and so uh, i would go to his gym that week that i was there um, visiting my sister and i would just talk with him and like oh, i gotta ask him some physical education questions you know, just, right, a, just an excuse, right. to, you know, <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's all business, right? Business. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just had to have an excuse to go visit him in his gym. And he was just so different than anybody else I'd ever met. He was mature. He had his own house. He had his own car, if that's what you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> It got him from point A to point B. My car was $300 That's and it didn't even have yeah. door handles. So I'm just yeah. saying. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Did you get in through yeah. the window? Yeah, yeah. I had a wire. I just had to yeah. reach in and grab a wire. So, yep. Oh, my God. And goodness. it was just, you know, I, that was an attraction to me, though, because again, money wasn't important to me because all money ever did was, was show pain, you know, from the, my past. Because what the abusers would do is, um, if, if I didn't do something right, uh, I didn't, I didn't clean the bathroom, right. Or I didn't clean my bedroom, right. Or whatever. Then, um, you know, they would say, I can't believe that you did that. We just bought you these brand new tennis shoes and you didn't do that. Right. You know, it was just, nothing was ever good enough, you know? And, and I was just, I was just yearning for unconditional love, unconditional love. And when you don't have unconditional love, you search out through all the wrong places for it. So anyway, back to 2001 when I met Jason 
And so uh, we just got to know each other. We started talking, you know, um, every day, but I still had my boyfriend. So I, I couldn't really, you know, be in a relationship with Jason because I wasn't really sure. Cause I thought, well, here's this guy I'm 10 minutes from and Jason I'm 10 hours from, you know? And so that's just kind of a hard, hard thing to, to get into when you're not really sure. So we took many months just talking to know each other. And then we started dating in August, uh, actually Labor Day weekend, August, um, September, 2001. Um, we got engaged in December and then got married in July. And I told him a little bit about my past, you know, but again, I didn't realize I see now, but I didn't realize then how broken my past and my childhood really was until after I got saved and the Lord obviously revealed all of this, you know, to me. But again, like I said earlier, you only know what you know. Uh, like we talk about with people all the time. If you raise your children to not brush their teeth, not take a shower, not clean their bedroom, you know, bad hygiene, then all they know is, well, I don't got to brush my teeth. I don't got to, you know, clean my room. I don't have to do any of this. So then when they grow up, they, they don't know to do that because they weren't taught. So whatever you're taught, whatever harvest is, is grown, that's what you're going to live in because that's all that you know, whether it be good, whether it be bad, that's what you're going to do. And so that's what I did. And, um, so I eventually, when we started the relationship, I brought all of my baggage from my past unresolved hurt, unresolved, hard, hard heart, um, unresolved issues <clears throat> that I'd never got taken care of in my past. I brought it into my marriage. And yeah. so now your, your childlike um, tendencies and habits and maskings are now adult maskings and, and stuff. Cause I would self mutilate. Like I said, you know, I would, I would steal. I was just a real rebellious. I, you know, got stopped by the cops because we would be stealing things from different stores and we threw rocks at cars that were driving past. I mean, just stupid kid stuff. Um, I lived a totally different lifestyle of, uh, homosexuality for many, many years, um, that I, Again, I did not like women. I wasn't attracted to women, but again, I was just trying to find happiness in all the wrong places because I had that God-shaped void in my heart that I didn't realize at the time that only God could fill. So going into my marriage, I had very um, unrealistic expectations that I expected Jason to meet and take care of for me that only God, God could do in, in, in someone's life. Right. You know. And so, so, so let's maybe pause there, um, Shannon, because mm -hmm. there, there's a lot to unpack there. And I, I want to go yeah. back to your childhood a little bit. You know, you're talking about suffering so much abuse throughout your childhood. And I'm curious, are, are you an only child? Nope. I have two other sisters. Okay. And did any of your other siblings experience uh, abuse similar to you? Yes. Um, a little bit different, but because I, I always struggled in school. I had a learning disability. And so my abusers didn't really know how to handle that. Um, so I would go to different like um, tutors and stuff like that. And so that was a real struggle in my household where my sisters, they were very book smart. Um, they didn't have to, you know, like if they studied for an hour, I had to study for three hours, you know, because my brain just doesn't process things as well as theirs does. And so that was a real struggle in my house. So my abusers would kind of um, abuse me in that way as well. Call me stupid. Um, I would never make anything of myself. I'm nothing but a whore. Nobody's ever going to marry me because all I am is trash. They wish I was never born. Um, I'm not worth the skin that I'm in. Um, I mean, it just, it goes on and on and on. And, and so, and the power of the tongue is in, you know, scripture in the, in the Bible is so true because you can hit me all you want, but those scars of hearing what was told to you by people who are supposed to love and care for you are words that you will never, ever, I don't care how much counseling you have, you will never get those words out of your mind and you relive those every day. The Lord's helped me, no doubt. I couldn't be sitting here today talking to you if he did it, but those are just words that you hear over and over. And so you start to believe them about yourself because they have to be true. If they say it about you, then you believe it. Yeah, for sure. So between the yeah. combination of, of those comments, and it sounds like, I mean, you're, you're seeing your sisters be successful in education, you know, things are mm -hmm. coming a little bit more easier to them. And, and you have to really put in the work for that stuff to come to you. Yeah. How did that 
I, I can't even imagine how that affected your self-esteem and how you viewed yourself even from a super young age. Yes, I, I felt worthless. I had no self-worth whatsoever. And I still struggle with that today. My my insecurities, you know, like Paul says, a thorn in his side, that's my thorn in my side. You know, I don't struggle with any of my addictions that I had in the past. I don't care about drinking. I don't care about drugs. I don't care about any of that. But my insecurity and self-esteem is what wrecks my world so many times because that it is my weakness. That's what I was just drilled with when I was younger. Um, so my sisters, they were, they were very beautiful. And so I was always compared to them. Why aren't you as pretty as your sisters? Why aren't you as smart as your sisters? You're never going to be as good as your sisters. But then now I will tell you, my sisters, they struggled with different things too. They are both now alcoholics. They have both had affairs on their husband. See, so people, people act out their trauma in different ways and some choose to get help and, you know, give up that selfish life that they have and live for the Lord. And some don't, you know, and they just happen to not because they don't, they don't have that relationship with the Lord whatsoever. So they have continued that life of masking and mm. self-medicating. Oh man. So yes, oh, man. they've been affected as well. Yeah, for sure. How did that affect your guys's relationship growing up together? Like, each of you, you're saying each of you kind of experienced trauma in, in your own way. Is that something that kind of bonded you together or did it kind of just feel like every kid for themselves? Yeah, we really bonded together. We had a very, very, very close relationship because there's been times where, for example, one time um, my sister, she forgot her books at school, some, something she had some homework to do and she forgot her books at school. And so um, our abusers would not take her to school, which was about, I would say probably a 12 minute drive, but how long of a walk? I, you know, I don't even, maybe 15 minutes, um, how long of a walk? I don't know. And so we had to um, walk to school. It was about eight o'clock at night and we were just hoping that someone would be there, maybe a janitor to have the you know doors open. And so we had to walk all the way to the school in the middle of the night, raining, get, because I wasn't going to let her go by herself. And um, we had to walk back. And I don't even know what time we got back. It was, I mean, I was probably uh, eight. She was probably 12. And we had to, we had to do that in the middle of the night. Yeah. Um, Cause they just wouldn't take us to, to get her books because we weren't allowed to make a mistake. You know what I mean? Like we had, again, we had to live up to this expectation that nobody can live up to even the most perfect person, which none of us are could live up to these expectations that were put on us. And so after a while you just say, forget it. You throw your hands up and say, forget it. I'm done. I'm not good enough for you. I'm not good enough for anybody. Yep. Yeah. Why do you think that standard was set by your abusers? You know, as hindsight being 2020, obviously you've, you know, I'm sure I've done a lot of reflecting, a lot of counseling in the years since then. Have you been able to kind of formulate, put together, why were you, your abusers the way that they were? Why did they treat you the way that they did? Yep. 100% I have that answer. And that is because they're broken as well. I found out some things in their past that I did not know until after I got saved and I don't have a relationship with them anymore. So I have really done some research on why, 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 and, uh, I now know, and they come from brokenness as well. And they never surrendered their life to the Lord to help them through what they had been through. And so all these years now, they've just suppressed it and push it down and push it down and push it down to where they just live a life of hard, 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 a hard heart, I'm sorry, and pain. And so hurt people hurt people. So when you are hurting, you're going to hurt others. And though I forgive them with all of my heart and I pray for them every day that they find hope in Jesus and they surrender their life to the Lord, I know for my own good and my own family and my own health that I cannot be around them because they are toxic in my life. And the Lord, of course, has helped me through that. Yeah. What's that been like going through the forgiveness process? You know, it's, it's different for everyone. I work as a marriage and family therapist and, you know, I unfortunately see a lot of clients with 
similar stories as, as yours, Shannon, where, you know, a childhood filled of trauma and abuse by people that, you know, should be protecting you and, and, and loving you, not hurting you. Right. And so mm -hmm. how have you been able to walk out that whole forgiveness process? And I'm wondering, like, do you have any advice for anyone who's listening, who may have a similar upbringing as you, who are struggling to, to forgive their abusers, any advice that you would have for them? Absolutely. I remember the day. I remember where I was. I remember everything about it. I was reading scripture. Um, this is after I got saved because I didn't get saved. I know we haven't gotten to that part yet, but I got saved um, October 2nd, 2014. Um, so after I got saved, uh, of course, I'm just reading all kind of scripture. I mean, I'm just, I'm soaking it up like a sponge because this is all new to me. It's a whole new world I never knew. So I was reading one day and the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, they are broken just like you were. You have to forgive them just like I have forgiven you. And I thought, but I can't. And he said, yes, you can, but you only can with me, with my grace and my mercy, just like I have forgiven you, just like your husband has forgiven you. You have to forgive them because all they know is brokenness just like you did. And I just happened to go to the Lord and get saved where they haven't. And that was the game changer right there, knowing where I came from and what I had done and that the Lord gave me grace and mercy and forgiveness that who am I to not forgive them because they're just as broken as I was. And, and really that's, that's the only way you can forgive someone, right? Like once you realize yep. that Jesus has forgiven you for your sins and at the end of the day, yep. your sins are no different than the sins of your abuser. That that's, that's right. a humbling thing. You know, that's a humbling mm -hmm. thing. And, and just a reminder that, yeah, we're, we're all broken exactly like you said. And so I am, I'm, I'm super thankful that, that you did come to know the Lord and that you, you are at this place where you can forgive them. And I'm sure, you know, sometimes that can be a daily thing is, is to forgive that person, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it can be a yes. process. And so I, I'm thankful that, you know, you are safe now and that, you know, we'll, we'll get to the marriage, but you're with an uh, amazing guy, you know, in Jason, who was able to, to give you a lot of those things that you didn't get throughout your childhood. And yeah. I, again, going back to your childhood, it sounds like sports were an outlet for you. Was, was yes. that, was that kind of like one area of your life where you felt like, okay, like I can just go and have fun. Or did you feel that pressure of, you know, it, it sounds like there's like a perfectionistic standard set w w within your, your home. Did you feel pressure as you were at practice at games to like constantly have to perform? Yes. So number one, for sure, it was my outlet. Like I said, it was the only thing that kept me grounded. It was the only thing that kept me from going to jail. It was the only thing that kept me from get, because, you know, if you get in trouble or you don't get good grades, then you don't get to play sports, you know? So I thought, well, I can't get in trouble. I can't, you know, because most of my rebellious things I did was more like, in, I mean, this is pretty bad, but elementary, middle school. Whereas when I got into high school, I kind of started thinking about my future more um, going to college and playing, um, college softball. So I knew that I couldn't get in trouble because I knew that record would follow me. And so I kind of started, um, just focusing completely on sports and not waiting, not being able to wait for the day for me to move out of my house. <laughs> so I knew that if I got in trouble, that would all be down, down the drain. So I really started focusing a lot on sports it was my outlet, but also game day was very, very, very anxious for me because I knew that they would be there. And so whenever they would walk in, I would already dread it because I already knew the stakes were set so high that I would never reach them. So why even bother? And cause I knew if I didn't live up to their expectations that night in that game, I was going, I was going to hear about it all night long and get called every name in the book and just and I just say, just why bother coming? Just don't come. Just don't come to this game. I, I'd rather you not be there because then I can enjoy it more and I don't have the stress of it, you know? Um, but yeah, so yes, definitely an outlet, but also very anxious filled time for sure. For sure. And, and so between anxiety, between a perfectionistic standard being set, 
my mind goes to, especially you being a, a young teenage woman at the time, my mind kind of goes to like body image, right? You yeah. know, like that's, that's a time in life where obviously puberty bug is hitting. And for me personally, you know, as, as a guy, as a dude, like I struggled with anorexia during my teenage years because of insecurities of how I looked and just anxiety issues, control issues, things like that. And so I, I, I guess I'm just curious for you, Shannon, like did just growing up the way that you did. And I mean, you mentioned the incident where you had to eat everything on the table. Like, did you struggle with any type of eating disorder throughout your teenage years? I actually, surprisingly enough, did not. Um, when I say sports was my life, I literally slept, drank, ate, breathed sports. So I knew that I couldn't do that and be anorexic or bulimic and have the energy to play the sports. So that really wasn't too hard. That came into play later on in my marriage. Um, the the um, I, I wasn't bulimic, I was exercise bulimic. And for those of you that don't know what exercise bulimic is, is I would eat something and then I would go exercise it off because I was an athlete. So I love to work out. I always worked out. So I would eat something and then I would, I would exercise it off. Um, or I would just not eat at all for the anorexia. That didn't come so much with body image that came with not good enough, not good enough. If I'm skinnier, I'll be good enough. If I'm, you know, prettier, I'll be good enough. Cause I was a model, um, back in 20, uh, I gotta think here a second, 2005. Yeah. Cause I had my daughter in 2006, so 2005, I was a model in Nashville and, um, I was a size six and they considered that uh, plus size. Wow. Yeah. God. So yeah, I was like, I'm five, eight, 120 pounds. That's crazy. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I would, that's when I really started doing that. But then I saw that's, this is not, this is not right. You know, this was not right that I was anorexic, bulimic, trying to maintain that weight. So I only did that for a little while. And then I stopped because I knew it just wasn't good for my health, but I, I, I was very, um, I did, I did struggle with that because of, again, just being good enough. When people live a life of um, not having that unconditional love, not having that acceptance, you do anything and everything to be accepted, to be loved, to, to have that attention, whether it be positive or negative, you want that attention. Um, and that's, that's when I struggled with, with bulimia and anorexia. I was just trying to get that good enough. Sure, physique. sure. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes total sense. And, you know, you mentioned during your teenage years, you started acting out rebellious behaviors. And in my mind, just kind of, you know, thinking back to my high school years, it, it almost kind of seemed like the people that were the quote unquote troublemakers, the ones that were doing drugs and stuff like that, they were often the most inviting and, and kind of like, almost kind of like nice people because yeah. they were the ones that were used to being rejected and, and kind of the yeah. outcasts and stuff like that. And so for you getting into that crowd, getting into trouble, was that kind of the attraction there? Was that, Hey, like they're accepting me for who I am and I'm able to just kind of Definitely. be whoever. Definitely. Yes. And you know, it's that old saying, misery loves company. I was miserable. They were miserable. Let's be miserable together. You know? And when you don't really have any reason to live, and that's why sports became so important to me, uh, when you don't have a reason to live and you don't care, you don't care what you do. You don't, you don't care what happens. I didn't care if I would have been killed in, in, a, in a ditch somewhere. I didn't care because you start living a life of no meaning. What's the meaning of life? If all I do is upset people and let people down and get called all these names, who wants to live that way? And so I, um, I overdosed on ibuprofen back in, um, oh gosh, I was 18 or 19. I can't remember. It's real, real fuzzy right there. Cause it was a really bad time in my life. Um, and went to the hospital, um, got my stomach pumped. They took all, ki all kinds of tests, everything. And I ended up being okay, of course, but my abusers, we got home. And instead of saying, Shannon, let's talk about this. Let's get you some help. Let's Let's do something. All you want is attention. I can't believe that. That's just a ploy to get attention. I can't believe that you did that. You're so stupid. And I was just screaming for help. I just wanted help. 
I think it was 17. That's what it was. I was 17. That's what it was. And it didn't, it didn't, you know what I mean? And I didn't have anywhere I could go to somebody I could trust because when I went to our school counselor, they called them and they're like, Oh, Shannon's in. Oh, so now you're going to counseling. No, she, they actually said, um, um, Oh, what's that word for a, a like, a not a psychiatric. Oh my goodness. Anyway, it was, it was not a very good term of, for a counselor. And so it was like going to a counselor was a negative thing. And so I'm like, okay, now I can't even go to a counselor. A shrink. That's it. A, a shrink. shrink. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Um, she's like, oh, you're still not going to go to a shrink. I'm like, I just need help. You know? Did, so. Yeah. And that was the question that I had for you, Shannon, as throughout this whole time, did you have anybody in your life that you felt was for you, that, that showed you that love that you were looking for, that care that you were looking for, whether that was extended family, teachers, coaches, did, did you ever receive parts of what you were looking for, parts of those needs that we all have at all throughout your childhood? Yes. Uh, I had very, very, very amazing grandparents. Very amazing. They, whew, yeah, they were amazing. It was just a little hard because if I told them something, guess who they would tell? The abusers. Yes. So though they loved me and they showed me acceptance, no matter what, I had to be careful still. So to answer your question, yes, but no. So they were very, I mean, they let me, when I got kicked out, cause I got kicked out for not cleaning my bathroom the right way. So I had to go live with them and they, they welcomed me open arms, open arms, come on. You know, they took care of me, paid for my groceries, helped with so much stuff, but confiding in them. I could about what I was going through. I could not do because I knew that they would tell them. So yes, love, no doubt, love that I never knew before. Um, but to have someone to actually talk to about that stuff, I did not, not one single person. Man. And, and how, how lonely that must've been, right. To just feel like you're, yeah. you're kind of alone and trapped in your own world, so to speak. Yes. You mentioned, you know, in your quest to just kind of find love anywhere that there was a, a period there of homosexuality and not that you were attracted to women, but right. just, I, I don't know, I, I guess, you know, now in 2023, there's, there, there's so much of that, right? And, and we're seeing so many youth, so many people, you know, that were probably at the age that you were, you know, believing that, you know, they're homosexual or that, you know, they're the opposite gender. There's all sorts of confusion there. And so I'm curious to know a little bit more about that, Shannon, as far as kind of what led you in into that lifestyle for a little bit and, and how did you get out of it? Absolutely. So I was already a tomboy growing up. There was no doubt about that. And just because you're a tomboy doesn't mean you're going to live a homosexual lifestyle. I'm not saying Amen. that, but Amen. I was, you know, I was definitely a tomboy, very involved in sports, of course. So I just kept on looking for other outlets for me to go through to, to be accepted. And so, um, it started out when I was in, um, second grade, um, with just, you know, playing doctor, you know, with my girlfriends, uh, just innocent, didn't mean anything, but for some reason I felt a connection and quote unquote love and acceptance. Cause this is all about love and acceptance, no matter, no matter what. Okay. So. I found love and acceptance to that. So then that was in second grade. It continued on a third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, all the way until I met Jason. So how, what second grade to 21 years old, 20, 21 years old. And so that's a very long time. Um, I had a best friend who ended up being um, a lesbian and she, she still is. Um, actually she had a sex change she's, she is now a he, um, but we were best friends. And so we were together so much. And, um, even though she dated guys, I dated guys. It was like her and I all the time we were together all the time. So it was like, I was kind of living both life's styles, both with girls and with guys. Um, and so that friendship, and of course it's just a lie from the enemy. Oh, you're gay. You know, sh she'll love you. That's not true. You know, I was just living in sin. I was living a lie, but the acceptance and the love was, was awesome because 
we would go to like the gay bars. We would go to all these, you know, gay groups and everybody was so nice and so welcoming and so accepting. Like they were so nice and it just felt really good. It felt good to be accepted. It felt good to be wanted. It felt good to be liked. It felt good to be quote unquote loved. You know, it was great. So it was more of the friendship and the acceptance more than anything. Yeah. It's as you were talking there, it just shows that the enemy will, he, he's so crafty in presenting the right thing in the wrong version of it. Right? Yes. You know, here you were wanting love, wanting acceptance. And so he, he gave you outlets for it, but, but not the right versions of it. Right. Like right. the, 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 the perverted versions of it. What's a perversion? Mm -hmm. It's the wrong version of, of something. And right. so here you are doing, you know, all this stuff. And, and was it meeting Jason that kind of got you out of that lifestyle or, or how did you kind of fully walk out of that? Yes. Um, meeting Jason, I knew that I was going to marry him, whether he liked it or not, I was going to marry him. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, uh, cause I found, I mean, I found the one I want to be with and that was it. I was determined, you know, and moving away from those, you know, it's the crowd that you hang out with and moving away from that crowd was a game changer, you know, and it, and it revealed to me, even though I wasn't saved yet, it still revealed to me that it was just something I was, it was an outlet. It was something I was just masking again, masking my pain with. I knew I really, once I moved away from all of them that I hung out with, I'm like, I didn't really like them that way anyway, you know? And even when I was in it, I knew this is not what I want for my life. But again, it was that five minutes of just it felt good. You know, it was just because it's like a drug addict. They want that hit, even though after that hit and that high is gone, they're going to be down again. And then they got to hit again to get back up and then down and then up. And it's just a roller coaster, of, you know, highs and lows, literally. And so um, once I got out of that lifestyle and away from those people that I hung out with it, everything changed. Well, praise God, praise God that you were able to get away. And and so, yeah, let's talk about that before we switch over to Jason here. You turn 18, you graduate from high school. I don't know, putting myself in your shoes, Shannon, my thought would probably be like, get me the heck out of here. Like graduation day, like get me out of here, right? So so what was that like for you? You know, what was what was kind of the process of, of you figuring out what you wanted to do after school, where you wanted to go to college, uh, things like that? So ever since I was 12 years old, I knew that I wanted to be a physical education teacher. No one could have told me any different. So I already had my plan of I was going to attend Grand Rapids Community College for two years and then go from there to Grand Valley State University and graduate from Grand Valley State University with my physical education degree. And I was going to move to Tennessee. This is before I even knew Jason Wright at all. I've always wanted to move. Yeah, I always wanted to move to Tennessee because uh, my family, we would visit Gatlinburg and, you know, all that for, for vacation. And I just always loved it down here. You know, I love mountains. I love the peacefulness of it. Um, up North is always just, ah, 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 just, you know, everybody here is so nice and everybody up North is so cold and literally cold, freezing snow. <laughs> so, uh, I, I told him, I was like, even if I didn't meet and marry you, I was still going to move to Tennessee because that's just somewhere I always wanted to live. So um, when I met Jason, you know, at 21, then that was perfect. You know, like, what's the chances that I was going to meet him and marry him and end up moving here anyway? So, yeah, so I was already on the, you know, the road of I, as, if I could just move out and, and live for myself and take care of myself. And I had a job so I could, you know, I, I paid my own groceries. I paid my own college. I paid my own car. Like I did I, everything. I've always been a very hard worker a very hard worker. And so I was determined that I was not going to need them anymore. Whatever that took, I was going to get out from their roof, but I didn't have to worry about that because they already kicked me out. So I was living with my grandparents. And um, so I went to college and, and did all that. And then of course, when I met Jason, I finished up at Middle Tennessee State University with my degree. So yeah, I, w I was headstrong on getting out of there. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that you were able to get out and man, what you know, we could, you know, push the stop recording button right now and have an, an amazing episode just based off your individual testimony there, Shannon. Thank you so much for sharing that. But there's so much more to your story. And so now let's let's switch over to, to you, Jason. 
you know, so we got Shannon's background heading into the relationship. Let's get into your background, man. Let's start with where did you grow up and what was family life like for you? First, I got to say that we now know the real reason that uh, Shannon married me, and that was to get out of Michigan and just get to Tennessee. It worked. Right? <laughs> God answers prayers, right? <laughs> yes. That's right. Yes. Um, okay. So my story is is definitely different than, than, than Shannon's. Um, I grew up here, Southeast Tennessee, in a little town called Birchwood, Tennessee. Um, very small town. My dad uh, is uh, was a pastor then and still currently pastors a church now, uh, the Decatur Church of God. Um, I had an amazing childhood. My, my parents are so loving. I mean, um, always kiss me, love me, supportive, uh, affectionate. Um, my mom always, I love it because she's my mom's not a super affectionate person, but she shows love with food. So she cooks. Everybody that comes to her house needs to eat, and you're going to eat 17 plates of food. <laughs> and then when you're done, you're going to eat again. Um, but that's the way she showed us love. And my dad, my dad is, has always been a really strict disciplinarian. Um, he was he was tough on us. Don't get me wrong, he was tough, and 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 we got lots of spankings. And and I'm a better man for it. Everyone I got, I deserved. Um, but. What happened with me uh, and how we ended up and this, this thing will be a, a beautiful story in the end, but looking at the issues that Shannon had and then looking back at some of the things that happened in my childhood um, and then how we came together and then it just created, it was like, mm -hmm. my dad says it's like two streams coming together. They're peaceful streams, but when they meet, they become, there's rapids, there's things that happen because there's turbulence and you have to eventually get through that turbulence and let it just kind of smooth on out. And it's a beautiful picture of, of, of marriage, really. Um, but to back to what I was saying, when I was growing up, um, I was born in 1976, so I am an old guy. Mm -hmm. um, but in, <laughs> my dad lost his job. My dad had a great paying job at DuPont uh, in Chattanooga, uh, the chemical company. And in 1985, he lost his job. It got laid off through the recession. And it was a very tough time. You know, For me, it was. I can't speak for my brothers. Uh, I, think, I think they had struggles, too. But... Um, I was nine years old and I was getting right into those early formative years of where back when I was younger, clothes and all of that, and you had to have name brand or you were made fun of and it wasn't cool. And there was not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of information, uh, taught to children back then of how not to be bullies and not to pick on people. It was just, it was just part of our daily life. Um, but so what happened was I went to the local school, um, and I was wanting to play basketball my sixth grade year. And during my sixth grade year, I couldn't play because my parents didn't have money to buy my tennis shoes. And luckily, the coach found someone who would sponsor me and bought my shoes. And so therefore, I started off a career in basketball. Um, the school ended up having to get rid of their sports. And so I had to make a choice to either stay at that school and not play sports or be bused to Chattanooga to play sports at a large middle school in Chattanooga. And so I chose to do that. Uh, because I really liked playing sports and that was an extremely difficult transition. So I ended up in um, eighth grade, starting my eighth grade year at a middle school in Chattanooga. And one of the stories I always tell when we, when we were in conferences and so forth was I remember sitting in my science class and the science teacher had to go out and make, um, make copies. Um, and, and, and so she told, gave us some work to do. Well, the moment she walks out, the kids started making fun of me and they were chanting things um, because I got red hair and back, you know, one out of a hundred people have red hair. And so you're obviously the oddity and we get that, but they were chanting things that were extremely inappropriate um, about my red hair and how that, you know, body image and all that kind of stuff. So it was a lot of things like that. And then I didn't have really good clothes. I would kind of wear the same stuff every day. Um, and none of them were name brand. Um, I had the fake shoes, uh, the, the Kmart tracks, they looked like Adidas, <laughs> but everybody knew they were knockoff Adidas. Uh, and so everybody made fun of me. And when, when the teacher left that day, um, Terry and walked out, um, and I was, I could feel the tears wailing up in me because there was girls in there. I liked, and everybody was making fun of me. And I was embarrassed because the things they were saying, it was about being redheaded and the sexual, you know, sexual part of it. I'm trying to keep it G rated, but they were saying things that were, that were very embarrassing to me. And I remember sitting there and I, and they're making fun of my clothes. And I said to myself right then, I was, I guess I was 13 years old. I said, my kids will never know what this feels like. I will work and make more money than anybody. And they'll never know the pain of this. And I remember 
sitting there thinking that like it was extremely, extremely painful. Even right now, you know, it brings me a lot of emotion. So I came out of that, um, with this drive to make, where can I make the most money? Is it stocks? Is it real estate? Is it what? And I was going to be driven to do that. And so as you fast forward, I had a great career through high school, I actually had people that, you know, I, I was on the homecoming court for our, our school. I was a captain of the basketball team at, in, at a high school in Chattanooga. Um, so I had a great high school, uh, move off to college. Um, I had gotten saved when I was 12. Um, and, and, and that's, a, that's another element of the story. So my dad was a pastor. I remember the night, everything that I got saved, I call it my white knuckle moment when I grabbed the pew in front of me and the, the Holy Spirit's telling me you need to go up front. And I was thinking, no, everybody's going to know I'm a sinner and all that. Next thing you know, I find myself at the altar. I get saved. Um, but back then our church denomination did not do a very good, very good, um, what do you call it? They didn't have a very good process or, or understanding of theology. It was more of a condemnation and fear of theology. Um, and it was, everything was a sin in our denomination, everything. I mean, wearing pants, going to the movies, skating rink, it didn't matter. Everything was a sin. And so I felt that pressure. So when you get up changed from the altar and you go back, then this heaviness comes over you because everything's a sin. And when, every, when you feel like you're sinning, you're thinking you're doing wrong. And so I got to the, I felt so much pressure. I thought it seemed like it was more works based than relational. And I didn't understand it being a 13 year old, 12, 13 year old kid. So I just ran from the Lord. I started having hormones. I was going through puberty at girls, sexual, you know, uh, desires and so forth. And I was like, man, I'm a sinner, you know? So I was like, I can't continue to do this to the Lord. So I just ran. Now that's the enemy lying to me. But then that was the way I processed it, Terry. Um, so I ran from the Lord, got wild through high school, through college, drinking girls, you know, smoking weed, whatever. I got really crazy. Um, but once I graduated, um, graduated from college, from MTSU, I was a PE teacher as well. Um, so I had my certification to be a, a teacher. Um, and then I got a job in a, a little town called Lebanon, Tennessee. Um, and I was a teacher, basketball coach there. And then ended up meeting Shannon's sister, who became, uh, I was the head basketball coach. She was my assistant basketball coach. And from there is kind of where we uh, ended up meeting, as she mentioned earlier, um, in, in April of 2001. Okay. So that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, so what, what's kind of unpacked some of that stuff there. So your, your dad was a pastor. You gave your life to the Lord at 12 years old. What was that like growing up? in the church, you know, and again, I understand you didn't, you know, fully commit your life to the Lord and, until you were 12, but growing up, um, especially now being an adult, being a dad of your own, what's that like to kind of reflect on just that element of always having the Lord in your life throughout your childhood? So watching my parents who have, they're amazing. Everything that happened in our life, whether it was positive, whether it was negative, that was always approached from a spiritual standpoint of prayer. Um, my parents definitely aren't weird. They're not over spiritualizing things. Um, they're normal people, but I would see my dad and my mom pray to pray together every night, read the Bible together. I knew when I'd go in to give them a kiss at night in their bed that they would be, both be reading the Bible and that foundational, um, just, just being, being wrapped around our entire life with this foundational spiritual, you know, Christianity, uh, approach, uh, was super, it, it definitely, the, the benefits outweighed the negatives, right. And, 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 and maybe we could say, well, what's the negatives. And so that brings up this point, my dad, we, my dad started a church. He planted a church, uh, when I was eight years old. And when he started this church, um, it, the very first day there were seven people there, five of them was our family. Okay. And then my grandparents, and there was just nobody there. And I knew that's what the Lord had called him to do because of some of the things the Holy Spirit had hit. My dad had kind of fleeced the Lord and there was things that happened. So he knew he was supposed to start this church. But what happened with me was, and this is, and I've talked to my dad since then about this. And I don't, again, I don't blame him. He did what he do, what he thought was best at the time, but I never had a youth group growing up. I've never had a youth pastor. I never gone, I've never been to youth camp. I never did anything like that. I went to big kid church since day one, you know? And so I was getting the sermon preached to me in an adult manner. And it just didn't seem for the most part to be 
um, something that would, would give me this substantive change or grow me from, from a discipleship uh, way. And I became resistant um, to the point to where I, when I got to be 16 and could drive, I just didn't want to go to church anymore. I'd always try to find, oh, I've got basketball practice. Oh, I've got work today. And I just pushed back because I never had a group of like-minded people my age um, and youth pastors that were making it enjoyable. And so when I'd mention that to my dad and I'd want to go to another church, he would say, well, I, I can't have my son going to another church. They're going to say, why is the pastor's son not going here? And so that that was a big struggle for me um, because I think it was just the skill set just wasn't there. You know, there just wasn't a skill set that he had to be able to implement. Um, and, and probably it was money. It was a small church. You know, he couldn't go pay a full-time youth pastor to come in and all that. So long story short, I missed out a lot um, in my formative years of having a youth group. Um, and so as we fast forward to now, and I know we'll get to all this later, but it, we both as parents of our daughters, from the moment we moved back here to Southeast Tennessee, we said we will be involved in a church that has yeah. an extremely strong youth group and our children have thrived. And so we're trying, I'm trying to take, maybe what, what my parents didn't, didn't, you know, do very well, some of their weaknesses and hopefully better those now. Again, I don't blame them. Uh, I don't hold that over their head. They did the best they could. Uh, I'm sure we're not doing the greatest job and <laughs> my kids will probably say, man, we'll do something <laughs> different than my parents did. But, but I will say it was a, it was a very, having Christianity in my life from being youth, it gave me, it, I felt safe. Um, I felt protected. I learned to put my trust in God. I watched my parents that anytime they had a disagreement, they worked through it. Um, there was just this fruit of the spirit that was produced from both of my parents and how they handled relational issues and so forth. Um, and having that and seeing that modeled in front of me every day is unbelievably mm -hmm. part of why we're still sitting here today. Right. Yeah, man. What, what a foundation. I mean, as, as you were talking earlier about going into their bedroom and seeing them, reading the Bible and, and praying together. I, I just think how powerful uh, for, for any child to see their parents doing that, yeah. right? Like what a example that they set for you in, in that regard. And, you know, it's interesting, Jason, you mentioned giving your life at 12 and then at 13, you had that traumatic incident at school where, you know, everyone was making fun of you. You kind of vowed to, I'm just going to work, work, work to, to have the money to, you know, so that my kids never have to go through this. And it sounds like it was around that time too, you mentioned just kind of running from the Lord. And what, what I found interesting is that it almost kind of seems like the enemy played into that in, in the sense that you said that your high school years were good. You, you had, it sounds like some level of popularity. You were on homecoming court, you were a captain of the basketball team, you know, the girls, the parties, like it, it's almost like, again, kind of like what we talked about with Shannon, that the, uh, the enemy presented to you the right thing as far as being accepted and friendship and stuff like that, but the wrong version of it is, is, is that something that you recognize? Yeah, I think, I think that was the thing. So when, when, when I started playing basketball, um, and then I was, I was uh, on the varsity team as a freshman in high school. And so that don't happen a lot. I think there was two guys that, that made it who, who we both later became co-captains, uh, our senior year, but I was, I, I poured my time into basketball and that being successful at that gave me some notoriety. And so when the, all the, you know, thousand kids come to the basketball game, they would, they would see that I was the, I was the point guard. I was the captain of the team and they would. And, and so it gave me a lot of notoriety. So when we're going to parties and it was just all this attention that I was getting, um, and, I had already kind of pushed the Lord over and set him to the side because this felt good. You know, this was, this was feeling good to my ego and to my, uh, the things that I, I felt like I needed. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. It, it was presented wrong. And of course I didn't handle it right. You know, um, being wild and crazy in high school and, and college just probably wasn't smart, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it makes sense though. I mean, I, again, the things that, 
were a source of trauma and now you're getting them and getting them in spades from what it sounds like. It makes sense how that was very appealing to you uh, at, at that time. And so, yeah, you mentioned going on to, to college and becoming a uh, physical education teacher. And, you know, I, I guess this is where we can kind of pick up the story where you guys meet. And and so, Jason, let's let's start from you. Like when when you first met Shannon, what went through your mind? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great story. So um, Shannon was down with her sister. She was proctoring the exam, which basically is she's just monitoring the the, the Tennessee State standardized test um, in the classroom with children. So she was helping her sister, and she was down for the week. And so I went over to uh, to her sister's room, and um, and Shannon was there. I'd never seen her before. I saw a picture of her once, but it was just kind of a I just glanced kind of thing, you know. I, but when I walked in the room and, and Shannon was sitting there, I literally died. I mean, I'm not joking. We talked, we talked, and I walked out of there. I made a straight beeline for the principal's office. I walked in. I told my principal. They were eating lunch, principal and vice principal. I walked in, and I said, have you seen so her, sister's, um, her, her sister's um, sister? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Try not to use names. Right, right, right. Um, and she said, and they said, no, we haven't. And I said, one word, supermodel. And I was dead serious, man. I was just, I was just smitten. And I'd never been, been, you know, you know, felt that way about somebody before, but I just didn't think I had a chance. And I just, I just thought she's beautiful, but I just don't have a chance. And then later that afternoon, um, after she got done proctoring the test, she, she came over to my gym. And I honestly, I can tell you right now with full honesty, I was so naive. She came into my gym and we sat on the sit on the bleachers while the kids were while the classes were playing, and we were talking. She's asking questions about uh, physical education because she wasn't a teacher yet; she was still in college. But she was asking about, and I seriously, I'm so naive. I seriously thought she was really just curious about BE because I never believed that she would like me. Uh, but later, I looked back and thought, man, I'm such a dummy. Like, I, you know, <laughs> she was she was flirting with me, and I didn't even know it. Uh, <laughs> but but we wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for her because she she's actually pursued me because um, I didn't think I had a chance. I knew what I wanted and I was going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> Shannon, you mentioned earlier that, you know, when you saw Jason, you just knew um, that was the man that you were going to marry. And and you mentioned mm -hmm. that, that there was a lot about Jason that was, you know, attractive to you. You mentioned the car and how obviously money was not, you know, a, a, right. a factor at, at that point. What What else was it about Jason that just kind of just clued you into like, I, I can't imagine life without him. The way that he carried himself, um, again, I can only go by what I was used to, you know, the guy, and I, I never dated bad guys. Don't get me wrong. They, they, they have, every guy I've dated has treated me great. Um, but just the way that he carried himself, he was very mature. He, he was very respectful. Again, his Southern draw, whoo wee, you know, that was really nice. Um, and he, like I said, he had his own house. He was remodeling his house. Um, growing up, uh, my parents, they would buy houses and fix them up and sell them or you do them as rentals. And I would help them on the houses. And it was actually really fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, and so when, when I saw that he was doing that to a house, that was an attraction, you know, um, he was good with his hands cause he could build things, you know, he would, he remodeled his whole house by himself. And I thought that was really, that was really cool. You know, um, and of course he's a physical education teacher. He loves sports. I was, I was going to school to be a physical education teacher. I love sports. And so we just had a lot in common and I just feel like we hit it off instantly and just became best friends since day one. That's awesome. I, I, I'm curious for you, Jason. I mean, obviously you guys had two very different upbringings, right? You know, that much is for sure. As, as you got to know Shannon and, and I'm guessing during that period, Shannon, you would start to share aspects of your upbringing and, and, and the trauma, the abuse that you endured for you, Jason, what was that like to, to hear that? And, and not only to hear that, but then to kind of recognize that, wow, like I'm being entrusted by God, you know, with, with this woman's heart, you know, that, that has been through a lot. And now like, I'm, I'm kind of being trusted to hold it. What was that like for you? Yeah, that last piece, I probably, because I, I wasn't living close to the Lord then, I didn't really think about it from a spiritual standpoint. Uh, we approached this in all the wrong ways, probably. 
you know, we, we went no, there's into, no problem about it. We, we approached it wrong. Yeah. I'm being conservative. <laughs> yeah. advice, Right. But we went into this, you know, we were going to live on love. Mm -hmm. There was this attraction. Um, and I did not do a whole lot of spiritual inventory and all that kind of stuff going into this. But I was told by our sister and, and her that the abuser, um, had some major issues like that major. And I was like, no, cause when I met that person, I was like, no, they're wonderful. And I just didn't realize it because I had never dealt with that. I'd never seen that. I didn't know to the level of depravity or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. I didn't, I had never seen anything like that. So I didn't really have a benchmark. I just thought no way. Cause that just wasn't my normal. The lens I looked through didn't, we didn't deal, we didn't deal with that stuff. Um, and so I didn't understand the level of how traumatic and how terrible the situation. Now I'll be the first to say, I saw it with my own eyes, you know, like I saw some crazy stuff, um, through, through when we were, you know, going through our, 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 our courting stage. And then ultimately in the, the first few years of our marriage, I, I, there was things I saw about the abuser that would happen. I'm trying to be careful how I say mm -hmm. this. Um, but there was things that I saw that was just blew my mind and it would just like, be like, wow, you know, I can't believe that this is being handled this way. Um, and so that was before we had children. Um, but then watching Shannon and it hindsight's 2020 and boy, that sounds so cliche, yeah. but it's so true. You know, the older we get, the more, hopefully the, we, we, we aspire to be wiser than we are at this point. And as I, as we started getting a little more years and experience under us, and then we look back, we could start putting the pieces of the puzzle together of how there was brokenness there and how it was affecting negatively, um, Shannon's psyche and how she handled things. Um, but yeah, it started off. I mean, I thought we were doing great, but then coming into the marriage, I had, and this was another piece too, like, and, and again, not blaming the parents, but we had zero, my parents, Oh, not blaming my parents, but we had, um, zero premarital counseling, yeah. zero. We didn't have any premarital counseling. No. I was never, we were never even encouraged to have it. Like I was expect, you know, looking back now, I would think my, my dad would have said, Hey, you know, get some premarital, premarital counseling, but we had zero. And so I came into it with unrealistic expectations. I just assumed I was going to get to watch ESPN every day after getting home from work and then have sex at night. Life's going to be great, you know? Um, and, and that's kind of the way that I perceived that. So I had come in putting Shannon up on this pedestal, almost in an idolistic way. She's gorgeous. She's going to fulfill all my needs. You know, she's this idol. She's going all my sexual desires. This is going to, cause she's, and when she fell short of that from right out of the gate, day one, mm -hmm. there was unresolved expectations, yep. unfulfilled expectations. Um, and it just started this pattern, spiral a spiral of, of just constant fighting. Yeah. 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 So before we get to that, let, let's talk about the wedding. You know, obviously uh, a milestone event in, in anyone's life getting married, Jason, what was that like for you to commit to getting married? And Shannon, what was that like for you getting married? And and I guess a question in addition to that, obviously you're getting to know Jason's family at this point and very different than how you grew up. What was that like, you know, just kind of witnessing his family being accepted into that family um, and, and maybe getting love and, and affection, uh, from his family in ways that you didn't get, uh, throughout your childhood. Yeah. So of course, marrying at 22 years old and moving 600 miles away from everything I've ever known was definitely, um, freeing because I knew I was no longer under their roof and under their authority. Um, but it was still also scary because I had no friends. I had no connections. I had nothing except for Jason. And he was a basketball coach. So he was married to basketball. And so he spent a lot of time with basketball and not a lot of time with me. And I mean, he would, he was coaching, he would go scout, he would be out late at night at his games and he would watch film. And I would just be the little wife sitting there twiddling my thumbs, watching him watch film, you know? And so that was already very difficult. Um, number two with his family, it was, it was awesome because it was a family, um, environment structure 
that I had never known before. But at the same time, I was also very, 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 very jealous that I didn't have that. And though I knew I would never have that, I was also at the same time taking it in. So I would know how to raise our children when we eventually have children. And so it was a good teaching moment for sure. Um, just seeing the peace, seeing the love, seeing the prayers, seeing it. When you live in chaos, that's all that you know. The yelling, the screaming, the fighting, the cussing. That's all that you know. That's your normal. But then when you go to someone else's normal and you see how their life is lived, then you're like, wow, how I want that. How do I get that? You know, and it was just really eye opening and refreshing for sure to see that not everybody lived the way that I lived um, and that there was hope that we would maybe someday have a home like his family had and not the way that I was raised. So jealousy, but also thankfulness. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So what, what was that first year of marriage like then? I mean, Shannon, you, you, you kind of mentioned feeling, uh, uh, maybe a little bit on the back burner there. Cause you know, Jason was really committed to, to basketball, Jason for, for you. And, you know, I'll, I'll hear from both of you guys, but what was that first year of marriage like? Being so, well, I, I was really wasn't that young. I was 25 or 26, but I, I did. I absolutely poured myself into being a basketball coach. Um, we were very successful at it. We had won three state championships, um, and it was a middle school, but we had won three state championships, and we were we would usually be undefeated for the year, um, and it was an outlet for me because I really enjoyed enjoyed that. But it got it got out of balance. So when she stepped yeah. in, I didn't realize how much I was neglecting our relationship when I was pouring my time into work. And also I was pouring my time into other things that were trying to make us more money because again, I didn't want to, I always had this fear of lack. So that's where that started to raise its ugly head back in my life of, I don't want to feel like, I don't want to feel poor. So therefore, and teachers don't make a lot of money. So not only was I coaching to get this stipend or, or, or were, was getting a stipend, I wasn't coaching for the stipend, but I was, I was going to get this stipend that increased my salary some, Plus, I was still refereeing basketball games. Uh, we were flipping houses. We were doing all kinds of things, trying to make additional money. And I just wanted to get ahead in life. And I put so much emphasis on that that piece of it that I just neglected our relationship, to just to be honest with you. So, yeah. So, it's, you know, when I think back to the first year, it was, again, I, you know, it's new. It's fresh. So, that that has to wear out first. You know, that has to kind of settle in. So, there was some of that that we were living on. but then. Um, but then it became this, uh, she had unfulfilled needs. She would, she likes to go walking. She likes to, um, uh, exercise, she likes to do those kind of things. And I was just tired. I just, I, I just want to watch ESPN. I, I put my day in, I didn't want to go walking. Um, and it just created issues over the years from that point further, it created issues where I would then later at night say, well, let's, let's make love or, or whatever, let's be intimate. And she would say, Oh, I thought you were too tired. I thought you were too tired to go walking. And we would get into this huge fight because I just didn't enjoy walking. I was like, why well, walk? I can sit right here, you know? And, and then I, but, but because we're such, we're, we're built even with a selfish nature. I mean, it's a sin nature, you know, we're built with that. And it, and it was just, it was hard for me to die to myself as the scripture calls us to. But again, this is where I had walked away from the Lord. I wasn't in tune with living our marriage out the way that God designed it. And so this is just the beginning of, of the, what do you want to call it? The, the, the beginning of, of beginning stages of future catastrophe that later came in our marriage. Um, but yeah, it was, it was definitely a change having her there, um, you know, someone to spend my time with. I'd been a teacher for, I guess, three years and really wasn't dating many people at all. Um, and so it, it was nice, you know, dating her. It was a fast courtship. We dated for about three months and then uh, got engaged in December. And then we were married the following July. So basically a year of courting and then, and then marrying. Um, and again, I, I was just like Shannon. I knew that I wanted 
that I wanted to marry her. I'd been, I'd dated people before and just did not ever have that desire in my heart to think that was going to be my future wife. So it, it was pretty, we both were really quickly understood that we were marrying each other. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and so it sounds like very quickly on in the marriage too, that there was starting to be some, some problems, you know, some conflicts, you know, Jason, you, you were really focused on basketball and, you know, just kind of dealing with, you know, just coming home and I'm tired, but yet I still want, you know, affection and Shannon, it sounds like, you know, you were feeling more so alone and it's just like, well, but you don't want to spend time with me. And now you expect me to give you know, my body to you, like what's up with that. And right. so Jason, you mentioned that was kind of like the beginning of, of the problems. And, and so I guess what, what's kind of delve further into that as, as time went on, what, what kind of happened next in the marriage? So. Well, I was, um, of course I was still in school. I was still attending middle Tennessee state university at this time. Um, because we got married in 2002 and I graduated in 2004. So I still had two years of, of school. So I would go to school and then right when I was done with school, he expected me to go to basketball practice. So I have to stay with him basketball practice. If I wanted to go home and do my schoolwork, he would get upset and he'd be like, well, I want you here at basketball with me. But, but I needed to get my schoolwork done because I wanted to have the evening together, but then he would just watch film all the time. And then I would want to go for a walk. And it really wasn't about the walk. It was about this, the time spent together. Like yeah. in my head, I had this fairy tale, like, well, we're going to go walking at night and we're going to have dinner together and, you know, sing Kumbaya, my Lord. And, you know, just have this fairy tale <laughs> marriage. But again, we go into a marriage very selfishly. Well, I want my needs filled. Well, he's thinking, well, I want, I want my needs filled. And so we have, we did not communicate very well with what our needs and wants were. Whenever we did, we would get very defensive you know, like I, I would say, well, I just want you to walk with me. And he's like, well, I'm tired. I don't want to walk. Well, I'm like, I'm tired. I don't want to have sex, you know? And so it was just this all the time, just a constant battle because I wanted what I want and he wanted what he wanted because we were not living for the Lord. We weren't going to church. We weren't doing nothing that we should have been doing. Man, man. Yeah. And, and so how did, as you're talking there, Shannon, I, I think that maybe on both parts, probably didn't take long for bitterness for anger, for resentment to start to, to kind of build up within each of you guys. And then that's kind of bubbling up in, in, in the marriage there. And so what, what did that look like for you guys? That's exactly right. Right from the beginning. I and mean, that's why when you said, talk to me about your first year of marriage, uh, it was right from the get go. It was not, it was not good. Um, the, we already had cracks in the foundation instantly um, because I started getting angry. He started getting angry. And so as time went on, then um, I started searching out for attention from other people because, again, I already had that in my past because even though he knew a little bit about my abuse in my past, I didn't really tell him everything because, number one, I didn't want to scare him away. <laughs> and number two, that was my normal. So I thought everybody lived that way, you know. So I'm thinking, well, if I just tell him that, he's going to be like, well, so that's how I lived. That's what, you know. So I didn't really think that there was any really reason to tell him. It wasn't until 12 years later that we started marriage counseling that everything really came out about my past. And so as time went on, we just kind of started going two separate ways in our marriage. He was, you know, going towards his, you know, coaching and teaching. And I was going towards my teaching because by then I graduated college and got a teaching degree and, um, and started teaching. So we both taught during the day. And then we started a, a screen printing and embroidery business um, a few years down the road. Um, we're just giving you the condensed version. And then we started doing that. So we teach during the day, do the screen printing and embroidery at night. And then we ended up having kids. And so he continued to work all the time. I was raising the kids all by myself. Um, we'd come home, I'd make dinner and he'd go out and do the t-shirts because we were trying to make more money. And the kids would pull on his shirt and say, daddy, daddy, play with me. And he's like, I can't, I can't, I got to work. So here I am just a single mo mother living with a pretty much business partner under the same roof, um, raising our two kids alone. And it got lonely. It got lonely. And so at my job, there was, you know, um, some guys who gave me attention and um, over the years that friendship developed into um 
an affair that I started with one of the guys. And let me just tell you right now that the enemy doesn't present a stranger that you don't trust, that you don't know, that you don't like to ruin your life. He, he presents you with someone who you trust, who you have a friendship with, who you think, oh, this is no big deal. This is no big deal. Because you're not, you're not going to start an affair with a person that you meet five minutes ago. It's just not going to happen. It's not typical. It's just not typical. Yeah. You have to develop a trust and a friendship. And so this trust and friendship developed for five years. Five years it took for this affair to happen. Because it ended up being fertile ground. Even though we had our issues from the beginning, it had to develop into this um, fertile ground that, that was prime for an affair. So because sin is never satisfied, I had that affair in April. Then I was presented with another man had that affair in May and then presented with another man had that affair in June. So no matter what I did, I was trying to find satisfaction and happiness in all the wrong places, but it continued down the spiral road of destruction and it only kept on getting worse and worse and worse. So to kind of add a couple little things there to tighten up some of that with respect to, to dates and so forth. So we got married in July, 2002, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we ended up having our first child in 2006, our second child in 2010, and then children, job, um, like she said, the screen print and embroidery, that, that grew bigger than we ever thought it would. We, we started it just to make some side money uh, during the 07, 08 crash. Um, cause we were normally in real estate, we'd buy flipper homes and we'd work those and make extra money for our income. Um, but because the market went so bad, we said, what else can we do? Well, as a coach I had all these connections. So I thought, well, let's do uniforms, let's do shirts, let's do t-shirts, let's make, you know, apparel. Um, and so we started this business out of our bedroom, spare bedroom. It grew into our garage. It grew out of the garage. We built a commercial building and then we hired employees. And then in our final year, our fifth year of doing this business, we printed 61,000 t-shirts in one year while we were both still working full time with two children. Um, I would come home at about four o'clock. I would work from four to about midnight. I'd go to back to sleep. I would sleep on the couch. Shannon was sleeping by herself. Our children was, were in, in their bedroom asleep. I'd feel guilty. So I'd go in and lay with the kids because I kept telling myself, well, Shannon knows that, that, that I love her. So I, I need to make sure the children are taken care of. And so I would go and I'd, I'd spend time with them, which I thought was time. They're asleep. But it was more of a salve in my heart because I felt guilty of how much I was working. But say, well, okay, well, why were you working that much? Well, it goes back to that childhood of not having enough, having lack financially, not being able to have the cool shoes and the cool clothes and the nice car. There just there was no way for me to do that when I was younger. So it was came, it came back out roaring its ugly head as an adult. So when I started making money, I wanted to make more money. It wasn't because I was greedy. I just wanted to make more money to make sure my family was safe and make sure that we could have the things that we wanted to go to Disney world. I didn't want it to be a problem. Let's go to Disney world. And so in the middle of that though, Shannon was thinking, okay, she grew up around money. Money was used as a, um, as a, um, um, what do you want to call it? Um, more of a medication, like a prescription for solving mm -hmm. some, something that had been done to her wrong. So, Hey, here's more, here's more money. Here's something. Here's you a nice baseball or softball glove. Here's you. Mm -hmm. And she would get all these cool stuff to mask the pain, um, to try to make, make, make amends. There we go. Make amends for what had happened to her. And so when she saw me focusing on money, it made her nauseated. You know, she was just like, what money's not important. I just me. wanted love and attention. And, and I see, I had plenty of love and attention growing up from my parents. So I didn't, I didn't feel that was not a void in me. And so I was, I couldn't understand what was going on because she was showing, she was so frustrated. Um, and I was just like, but we've got all these jobs and we've got all these, um, you know, orders coming in. I've got to fix these orders. So long story short, it, 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 the job itself, the business itself created a ton of anxiety in me to the point I ended up in the hospital multiple times with stress and anxiety. Um, and so we said, Hey, we're going to sell the business. We sold the business in December of uh, 2013. And we had, I had the night that I had thought I was going to die, the anxiety panic attack. I laid on the couch. I was crying. I had this feeling of impending doom that my life was over. I was going to die that night. And I didn't even know if a week before that, if you'd asked me to define what anxiety or panic attacks was, I couldn't even have described it because I didn't, I've never dealt with it. And it just hit me out of left field. And one night I told Shannon, don't go to bed. Don't go to stay up with me. I'm going to die. You know, I was just going crazy. And so I got up immediately and said, we're going to the, 
we're going to uh, to the local church. We hadn't been in church, um, and we had been taking our daughter on Wednesday night to Awanus, uh, which, which is a Baptist program. Uh, we had been taking her to Awanus, and we said, that's the only church we know. So we drove to this church. I immediately went down to the altar, rededicated my life to the Lord. Uh, it was an amazing experience because I felt a lot of that lift off of me. Did I continue to struggle with it? Yeah, absolutely. But I do remember it was a it was a transformative moment for me. And we started taking our family to church. The business was sold. I thought, man, we're going to get our life back together. You know, we're going to get on a straight and narrow. We're going to do right. Um, that was in December of, of... No, it was March 2013. March. Yep. March 2013. Yep. Yes, I'm sorry. March 2013 is when that happened. Yep. We sold the business in December 2013. Right. Finally found a buyer, sold the business. Yep. Um, and then that following spring of 2014 is when the enemy at attacks and presents yeah. her with this fertile opportunity um, for these affairs. Um, and of course, you know, even though we're trying to live right, you're taking your family to church, doing all these things, a lot of those pain and a lot of those scars that had been developed through the first 11 or 12 years of our yeah. marriage didn't just go away. You know, she saw all of my warts. I wasn't perfect. I didn't have the skill set and understanding to know what I was doing wrong. So therefore, this other person, when I'm sleeping on the couch, this other person at work is telling her, I can't believe your husband's sleeping on the couch. I would never sleep on the couch. I would sleep in bed with you. You're beautiful. You're gorgeous. He don't know what. It, and, and so it was just this, Jason's terrible. This affair partner's great. Um, and then it just, it, you know, basically went into a full-blown affair at that point. Yeah. And, and, and so I want to clarify something. So in March of 2013, you guys went to the, the church and Jason, that's when you read it rededicated your life to the Lord. It, it doesn't sound like for you at that time, Shannon, that you gave your life to the Lord yet. Nope. So it was more so just kind of supporting Jason. Yes. Yeah. Because remember, I still, I still thought I was saved because I believed in Jesus. She thought That's she got right. saved at church camp, which, yep. the church camp when she was yep. 12. Yeah. When I was 12 at church camp, cause I did go to church camps. I did go to church. I, I've always gone to church when I was a kid. Um, even when I started, like my parents, they would drop me off. They wouldn't go to church, but they would drop me off and then they would come pick me up, you know, and stuff like that. But, um, I always wanted to go to church. I was always drawn to it. So that's why I thought I was saved. But see, I was not educated. I, but Terry, I didn't this, understand. This brings up a, a, an interesting thing and I'll make this part super brief, just as a side note. When, and, and of course I've grown up in church, you know, we, we're actively involved now. I caution people when you try to give the, the gospel uh, to a child and you say, do you believe in Jesus? And they say, do you want to go to heaven? Do you believe in Jesus? Well, every child's going to say yes. Yeah. And they go, okay, then, then say this prayer and you're saved. Well, I'm not saying that that's necessarily horribly wrong. I'm just saying that that person may grow up thinking that they had this transformative life, transformative yeah. moment in their life when, when it might not have happened for them then. And I've seen it over and over, not just her, but I've seen it over and over and over because we're in the ministry where people say the same kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I went down to the altar. I wrote on the card that I was saved, and but it, you didn't get up and turn from what you did. And, and it didn't create this transformative, the Holy Spirit being, being, you know, residing in us. And so I think that's kind of what happened with her. She just thought I got, I did what I was supposed to do when I was 12. I got, I got saved at church camp. Um, but then, but then she really knew she didn't. I know that I got saved at 12. I just ran from, I just backslid. So it, it is, it is somewhat different. I mean, we ultimately ended up at the same place. We were not living where we needed to. We need to come back to the Lord and become and, you know, get, get, get into proper fellowship with him. But, but I think that's a good, good point that, that, mm -hmm. that it's really good to watch and help children understand that they arrive at this with their own, you know, time with them and God arriving at whether or not they are going to be saved or not. For sure. For sure. I mean, I think that's a good point for people in general, right? You know, I think sometimes churches with, with good intentions, you know, they say that, yes, you just need to say this prayer and boom, you're saved. And there's often not a focus on the discipleship after that or in the sanctification after that. It's just like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a heart change. And then there's got to be behavioral changes because of your heart right. change. Right. And, and I right. feel like there's a lot of Christians that they don't get to the behavioral change because they just said the prayer and they're just like, all right, I'm good. I got my, you know, free ticket out of hell card. And, uh, you know, I can just kind of go on living life. And so I, I, I appreciate you speaking to that, Jason, because I think anyone listening to this right now, I think that's really going to speak to them and, and, uh, encourage them and maybe even challenge them to, to think about like, okay, like I gave my life to the Lord, but 
am I actually living for the Lord? You know, does, yeah. does the way I live actually back up the, the words that I said? So thank you for speaking to that, Jason. And so, so here you guys are then 2014 sounds like this is uh, maybe the year from hell you know, from, from what yes. it's kind of shaping up to be here. Shannon, you, you, you had that first affair. And, and again, we, we, we've talked about why that was, you know, this, this man at work was giving you the things that you weren't getting from Jason, you know, the, the, the attention, the affection, the love, the care, all that stuff. I I'm curious after that first affair, you know, you wake up the, the next morning or whatever, like what was going through your mind? Was there any sense of like, Oh my gosh, what did I do? Or was there more so kind of a justification as far as like, what's wrong with this? Like my needs are getting met. Uh, you know, my husband's not getting that meeting them for me. So I'm making sure they're being met elsewhere. Exactly. And the answer to that is both. Uh, because see, there, there's a wrong um, thinking in affairs. People think, well, if you don't want to be with your husband, just divorce him. It's not that I didn't want to be with my husband. I, I've loved my husband every single day since the day I met him in April of 2001. It's just, I had, I had needs in my life that were not being met. And if, if your spouse does not meet those needs and you're not right with the Lord, you're going to go find someone, something to meet those needs that are not being met. And so it wasn't that I wanted to divorce Jason. I would wake up in the morning and I was like, I love him. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? But all I could think of, like I talked about earlier, as a drug addict, I got to get my next high. I got to get that next hit. And for me, the, the affairs were not sexual. It was all about the attention. Because see, at home, I was getting all the sex I wanted from, from Jason. So I didn't go out seeking sex in these affairs. I just wanted their attention. I just wanted their... Good morning, beautiful. I hope you have a great day. That right there was my hit. That right there was my hit. And then at lunchtime, I hope your day's going great. Just want to let you know I'm thinking about you. That's my next hit. You know, the end of the day, I hope you have a great night. I'll talk to you tomorrow. That was my next hit. I didn't have to have any kind of affection. I'd have, I just wanted their attention to know that somebody was thinking about me. Somebody took the time to text me or Facebook message me to let me know they were thinking about me. That was it. And so yeah. I just thought, though my needs were being filled in that matter, my marriage was still miserable at home. And I was living a double life. I was living one way in front of my family, and I was living a completely different life away from my family. And looking at my girls, it just broke my heart because I knew what I was doing. But when you're in it, it's just like every other sin that's so selfish. When you're in it, you care what you don't care, if that makes sense. Um, when I tell people, it's almost like you're drunk. It's like you're, it's like you're living in a different world. You have to put behind you, um, what, what real life is because you don't want this fantasy life to stop. Like you just, it's like when you're drunk and you just don't care. That's why people do crazy things when they're drunk. Cause they just don't care. And that was me. I did care, but I didn't care because all I knew was I needed to be satisfied. I wanted my needs to be met because they weren't being met at home. Well, you gave a good example the other day, um, and this this will kind of take it away from from the infidelity piece. Eating is my vice. I love to eat. I don't have many vices, but eating is one of them. And quite often, and I love I love Thanksgiving, and this is a great example of of what it's like to be in an affair. Um, I love Thanksgiving food. It's probably my favorite meal of the year. And so when I go in and I start getting all the different items on the on the counter there for for the Thanksgiving meal. Um, all of a sudden I've got this huge plate of food, right? And I just needed a little bit of each, but because there were so many options and so many pieces that I, I had this huge mound of food and I sit down and I eat and eat and eat and eat. And it's so good, Terry. It's so good. And I mm -hmm. eat and I eat and I eat until I can't eat anymore. And I'm like, oh, but then I've got to eat some cake. And so I just push. And then when I get done, even though it was tasting so good, when I get done, I'm like, why did I do that? And now I'm miserable. Why did I do that? Yet I I know that that's going to feel that way, mm -hmm. but guess what? When Thanksgiving shows up this time, I'm going to do it again because it, I love the food so much. There's this craving in me to try to get this food satisfaction and I can't just eat a little bit because it keeps tasting good. So I keep tasting it. But then all of a sudden there's this fallout afterwards in consequence of, of me overeating. And it's kind of like that with any addiction. 
-hmm. you have you're chasing this this high you're chasing this feeling that you're getting these endorphins are going crazy in your mind even though it ends empty even yeah. though it ends and you and you like i said you get back to that low but to get high again you got to get high again you got to have that next shot you got to have that next text you got to have that next plate of food you know whatever it is that, that you're dealing with but yeah that was a great example we talked about the other day i said you know that you're gonna be miserable after that plate of food just like i know i'm gonna be miserable after this affair encounter so so why do you continue to do it you know but that's what addictions are yeah no, for sure. That's a, that's an amazing analogy. I, I love that. I'm, I'm probably going to steal that for my counseling. Not going to lie. So, so thanks for that. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, I mean, so yeah, you just kind of explained the, the mentality behind, you know, not just the first affair, not just the second affair, but now the third affair. And so when did it finally come out that, you know, Shannon for, for you that, Hey, like, this is what I've been doing. Yes. So, um, all of April was the first one. And then I began the second one in the beginning of May. And right when I was ending that one at the end of May, I had already met the third affair partner, but we weren't in a, an affair yet. We had just met. So I had, I was folding the clothes one day in the living room. I'll never forget it. It was like, it was yesterday. And our girls were at the neighbor's house playing and I was folding the clothes and something heavy on me. Cause I wasn't saved yet. Something heavy was on me said, you need to tell him, you need to tell him, you need to tell him. And I was like, cause I, I, I just had gotten out of the second affair because I knew in my mind I was going to get in a third affair with this other guy. We just hadn't gotten there yet. So I called Jason from outside. He was working outside and um, I said, you got to come in here. I got to tell you something. I, and I mean, it was like, I was going to vomit. I had to tell him because again, it wasn't that I wanted to divorce him. It was because I was a broken person looking for my needs to be filled, whatever that costs. So I bring him in and I tell him, and it was just pieces and parts. Oh, we just hugged. Oh, we just kissed. Oh, you know, it was just a text or whatever. And so I felt better because I got off my chest and I told him at least a little bit, you know, but then as it went on, oh, there wasn't just one guy, there was two guys. You know, and so, and he knew both of these guys. This came out over additional weeks and months. Yeah, yeah, it was over a, a time. And of course, over uh, six months, it all came out, everything. But this was just the first few weeks of the first two affairs. So as I'm telling him, now that he knows this, um, as, I, as we're working through this, beginning of June, middle of June, end of June, we go to on vacation together as a family, then I end up, being in the third affair when he thinks I'm done, but he did not realize I was in the third affair. So I, I ended that third affair at the end of June because people think, Oh, that must've been fun. You had your fun with those guys and all that. It's hell. It's living hell on earth because you're being tortured. You're being tortured, especially when you love your spouse and you don't want to divorce them and you love your children. Um, it's not like I just want to divorce him and go live this life of freedom. That's not what it's, it was total hell on earth because the enemy literally torture, tortures your mind and saying, don't tell him, don't, don't tell him because then you got to get out of it. Well, if I get out of it, that means I don't get that attention from those guys. And if I get out of it and I tell him, now I got to live with the consequences of my actions and we're going to fight all the time. So now we're right back to where we started 12 years ago of fighting all the time, you know? And so it was just this vicious cycle that the enemy doesn't tell you when you get into it. It's all these false, all these false promises, these false hopes, these false things that are, they're not true. It's all lies. So uh, we always tell people, you know, the grass looks green on the other side because there's manure below that grass because it's full of crap. You yeah, know, you need to water and maintain and work on your own grass and stop looking at the neighbor's grass. Yeah. Yeah. Jason, Jason, for you, what was that like when Shannon opened up about the affairs? What was going through your mind? How did you handle that? Yeah. And I hope this helps someone out there who's going through this. You know, when you first hear what's going on, honestly, I look across, I looked across the living room and I, I and, and this sounds terrible. Okay. Don't let anybody judge me, but I just thought, who is this person across from me? I mean, like, I didn't even know who they were. Like, it, I mean, I looked at Shannon and I was thinking, this is a monster. Like, I mean, honestly, I was like, what is going yeah. on? This is everything that had happened from the day we got married in 2002 
until now felt like a lie. It felt like everything, all the times you told me you love me, all the things we've done, all the memories we made were just lies. And as it came out in pieces and parts, and that's one thing we tell couples now when we're mentoring them, we know it's difficult. We know it's so mm-hmm. difficult to, to confess yeah. this kind of stuff to your spouse. But by Shannon going through this and trying to tell me, yes, I'm grateful she tried to tell me, but it, because it came out in pieces and parts and it was lies that precipitated lies and so forth, and it was just a constant lie, and I was struggling to get things out of her and trying to coerce her into telling me all the rest of the pieces, then she'd, that's everything, that's everything. She'd tell me, that's everything. And then more would come out. Well, that's everything. And then there was more that come out. And so it's like the moment you start to think, okay, let's get it out and then build back trust, then you were just building on a false premise because you thought, okay, I've already heard everything, but then I didn't hear everything. So it's like, okay, you broke trust by getting into the fairs, but then you're telling me lies all the time. I can't believe anything you're saying. But that honestly is kind of the way addicts are. People who have an addiction, who have infidelity or whether it's drugs or anything, it's, and we've all seen those intervention shows of the drug, drug people. But when you have that, it's, it's always lies because it's about self-preservation. Mm-hmm. And so when someone says, Hey, I, I'm already caught, but I can't tell all of that. So I'm just going to, I'm going to lie to try to get out of the rest of this. Um, but ultimately over time, it created a longer time frame for us for our restoration because it took Shannon much longer to continue to build back trust. So we say trust is lost in buckets and they're earned in drops. So you can, you know, all those attaboys go right down the drain with an old crap, right? And so the moment that she did this and made this this terrible situation, you know, as far as the infidelity part, all the trust that had been built over 12 years was gone uh, in, in just one fell swoop here. So as she's telling me these these things and I'm watching it come out in pieces and parts, then all of my insecurities growing up about being redheaded and girls not liking me because they didn't want to date Opie Taylor and, and you know, which was my, what people called me uh, when I was early on, all that came back to life. Like I am, I am the ugly duckling that, that I've always thought I was because now I can't, you're going somewhere else to get things. And so the person that in, in my position, um, we, we take it internally, we internalize this and we look at it from a standpoint of, um, I'm not good enough. It's something wrong with me. And it's embarrassing. It was embarrassing to me. I didn't tell anybody for, for a long time. Um, but as she begins to start telling me all these things, um, she says, Hey, I, I did these. And, th- and this is, and hear me out here that she would say, well, you weren't walking with me. You weren't doing these things. You were work was too. And all that was true. All of those things she said, 100% of all the things she said was true. Okay. She would say, you treat me like a paycheck and a piece of meat. All of that was true. And, but here's, here's the piece that kind of, no one can tell us a sin that doesn't have a selfish motive behind it or a justification. Even when Eve ate from the, uh, the tree of the, uh, good and evil, she did that because the enemy told her it's because God don't want you to know there was a justification there. I'm going to do this because, and so whenever someone falls short and I was falling short, the enemy tells Shannon, he's fallen short, so therefore go over here and get this, all right? And then things, opportunities are presented to him. And we tell everybody, the enemy don't show up to your door with a horn and pitchforks, okay? He shows up as an angel of light. I'm going to fix all your problems. And so you just go, whoa, that looks good, and then you go after it. But what we try to tell people is later, and this is the beautiful part here, part of the, I mean, the whole story is beautiful in the end, but during that summer, When she told me all these things, you're not taking me on vacation. You're not allowing me to stop teaching. She wanted to quit teaching. She was miserable and I wouldn't let her quit. Um, And so everything she ever wanted, she got that summer. She got to quit teaching. She got a gym so she could do personal training. She got a new car. We went on vacation. I cooked dinner for her. All of these things that we were going to, that I wasn't doing, I became super dad, super husband, and I did them. When you fast forward past that summer, um, on October the 1st, 2014, she had this craving in her to talk to this third affair partner. I didn't know there was a third affair partner during this whole time. We've been going to marriage counseling. We've been going, you know, back at church and all this kind of thing. And so on October the 1st, she went to our neighbor's house. She knew I was monitoring the phone records. She went to the neighbor's house, got on their phone, called him, and then goes and meets him at the mall parking lot while I was at work. And the moment she got out of his vehicle back into her vehicle and she had, you know, they had done their thing. 
she said, and I'll let her tell this story better than me, but she said that she felt like God was going to take her life. She said at that moment, it was so heavy on her that this was no longer about Jason. This was about her and her, her relationship with God. God wasn't going to let her continue to do this. And so I think if you want to speak a little life into that. Yeah. Um, so, so I went, so my first was April and then May and then June. So at the end of June, I stopped talking to all three of them. I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to get out of this. You know, if God's not going to get me out. I'll get it out myself. Okay. So, um, I, July goes by, August goes by, September goes by. Um, the third one would reach out every once in a while. Hey, how are you doing? I miss your beautiful face. You know, but I didn't talk to him. I didn't see him. I was like, whatever, you know, just kind of, cause I'm like, I'm trying to do this on my own. Just stay away, you know? So for some reason, October 1st, 2014, I have no idea why. Um, I just had to see him like Jason said. And so we met up, we, we had our, our last encounter together and I got out of his truck and got in my car. And for the first time in this whole process, um, I just sat in my car and I wasn't thinking about Jason and it sounds terrible, but I wasn't thinking about Jason. I wasn't thinking about my girls. I wasn't thinking about anything but God because I felt this heaviness on me. Like I thought I was going to choke to death. I thought I was about to die right there in my car. And so I just put my head on the steering wheel and just banged on it. It's like, God, get me out of this. Get me out of this. I can't do this anymore. I mean, I'm talking miserable, hell on earth, tortured. So I leave, go get the girls from school. We end up going to church that night. Um, like we've been, we've been going to church ever since March of 2013, um, continuously going to church. And so I knew the Lord in this year, because it's funny how it was exactly a year that he had been working on our family and how the enemy was just trying to get us, trying to get us, trying to get us. And so went to church that night, came home. And the next day we were going to um, Madisonville, Tennessee to look at a piece of equipment that Jason was going to use to develop some property. So it was um, me and Jason and his parents, Jason took the day off of work and um, we drove over there. And so um, I was in the front seat of my car. His mom was in the back seat of the car and him and his dad were looking at this piece of, piece of equipment in Madisonville, Tennessee. And of course his mom's a real good, you know, preacher's wife, woman of God, very spiritual, very, very sweet, very kind, very loving. And she had no idea, obviously what had been going on for the past six months with us. And so we're right. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't told them nothing. Yeah. They didn't know anything. And so, um, I just asked her, I was like, what? I mean, I was done. Like I was done, done with myself, whether it be, you know, blowing my brains out, whether it be overdosing on pills, I was done with this life and I had to get out of it however way I could. And so I just asked her, I said, how can someone ever be forgiven for all the sins that they've done in their life? Which 34 years of it was a lot, you know? And she's like, Shannon, you just have to surrender your life to the Lord. And for some reason that just, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I never understood what that meant until that moment. So God had been preparing my heart for this for who knows months. I don't, I don't know, but I knew that day was going to change. Something had to change or I, they would be attending my funeral because I couldn't live like this anymore. And so at that moment, I just looked up to the sky and I just said, or I surrender. Like I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't live this life. I, I'm ruining my marriage. I'm ruining my own life. I'm ruining my children's life. I don't want my children to grow up and be in a divorce home. I've got to do something. And we pulled out of that driveway and all of a sudden, like the sun was shining brighter. The grass was greener. I felt the weight of the world, literally, like where I was choking the day before, I could breathe for the first time in 34 years. Like I just saw my life completely change in front of my eyes. But it's funny because at this moment, I still didn't understand what happened. You know what I mean? I just knew that my life changed instantly, like a snap of a fingers. I just knew. And the weight of the world was off my shoulders. And I felt like the chains and the hard heart around my heart had just fell, just instantly fell. And I didn't understand why. And so we got home that day and backstory. We had um, ordered a book when godly people do ungodly things from Beth Moore. So let me add some right here to this. Yeah, it's a so cool we, story. We had been in marriage counseling with a Christian counselor. And during this time, it was, I mean, it was very volatile. I mean, extremely, extremely volatile. 
Um, somebody's coming. Oh, it's Nana. Um, it was extremely a volatile time. Um, Won't you go when they come in? Tell them. Okay. Um, and so we were going to Christian counseling, um, and sh the Christian counselor was pulling a lot of things out of Shannon. And boy, that was just that was torturous watching my wife literally lay in the floor at this counseling session and curled up in the fetal position. Um, it was unbelievable. I mean, the thing, because she had suppressed some of this abuse down so far that the counselor was bringing this back. But anyway, the counselor told her that you need to get this book called uh, When Godly People Do Ungodly Things by Beth Moore. And Shannon was extremely resistant to it because... I wasn't ready to get out of the affairs. No, she was I wasn't still, ready to change. She was still in the affairs. So I left there. Of course, we argued a lot after every session on the way home. I mean, when I say argue, I'm being nice. It was knockdown, drag out, you know, yeah. verbally. So I go ahead and order the book on Amazon. And then a few days later, or a day or two later, we're down in Madisonville. And God ordains that. Shannon gets saved, unbeknownst to her. And when we get back home that day, I had no knowledge of any of this going on. I didn't know my mom had talked to her. My mom and dad had no clue what was going on. We pull in the driveway immediately, two hours after she just met with, with my mom. And when we pull in the driveway, the book is leaning against our door. And it was, and she read the entire thing that in night. one night. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't put it down. Wow. I couldn't put it down. And so reading that book, I realized, I said, I got saved today. Like, that's what happened today. I got saved. But because it's not like someone told me, but now when you get saved, the grass is greener, the sun is brighter, you feel the weight of the world lifted off your shoulders. I, I didn't know any of this because remember, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. So this was all foreign to me. I just remember the freedom. That's the best word I can come up with. The freedom I felt that day was like anything I've ever felt before. Nothing. And so when I was reading that book and it was just literally reading my mail of what I had been living through all these years. And I was like, I got saved today. That's what happened today. And so from then on, it's like that book, and of course the Lord putting it in my life, but that book changed my life because it made me realize that I'm not the only one that's ever gone through this. You're not the only one that's gone through your struggles because the enemy lies and tells you you're alone. You're the only one in the whole wide world that's ever done this. You're the worst person in the world and you're going to be the only one in hell, you know, and it's, it's lies. So I just felt a sense of community through this book, even though I didn't know the people on the other side of the pages, but I felt like, okay, if they can make it, I can make it. We can make it. This, this can happen. Um, but it takes a very long road of healing in order for it to happen. What you see today is not what we were nine years ago. The Lord's done a miraculous work in our life, so, but we've had to be open about yeah. it and receptive to change. So for the sake of time, and I know we'll fast right. forward here. So that was October the 2nd. Um, I, we continue to go to marriage counseling fast forward until December the 31st, 2014. We were had bought a commercial building. We were working on remodeling it. I was up on a ladder and something just hit me. Something just said, ask her if she ever did anything with this person. You know, so I named the person and she says, you need to, we need to talk. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you got saved October the 2nd. And now this is December the 31st. And I'm continuing since June to learn about more and more and more and more. I thought we were over this. I thought we were through it. And now I'm finding out it was, there was a third affair partner. So even though she got saved October the 2nd, I had no clue there was a third affair partner. So as you can imagine, it was like being hit in the face with a sledgehammer. So we were actually down, we had bought a building down here in Southeast Tennessee. And we drove from that building, went back to my parents' house. And my mom had, had cooked dinner and so some soup. And I was eating my soup, didn't care about eating just sitting there and Shannon was down at the far end of the table. And this was a, a really crucial point in this whole story that happened. And it's, it's a very important point. She, I, she was stirring her soup, literally looking down like she'd seen a ghost, just stirring her soup, not eating. And I thought she's going to tell them, she's going to tell my parents. And I just sat there and all of a sudden she said, I got to talk to you guys. And she begins to tell them about all three affairs. Um, and nobody made her do that. She, she did it on her own. 
And she told him, well, the more she talked, the madder I got. And when she got done talking, I looked at my dad and I said, I can't stand her. Don't want to look at her face. I don't want nothing to do with her. And I sat there and I, I pointed my finger like that. I said, I looked at my dad and I said, I'm done. I'm getting a divorce. And I said, there'll be a woman that won't do this to me. One of the most crucial parts wow. of this whole story. So my dad... My dad had every option opportunity to get on my side as his son and just hammer Shannon. But the Holy Spirit stepped in in such a mighty way. And here's what happened. Here's how, here's the, the, the vernacular or the, or the trans what's transpired. When I said that there'll be a woman that won't do this to me, his immediate response without hesitation was he said, you thought, sh you thought Shannon wouldn't do it to you too. Don't throw your marriage away. There's no guarantee the next woman won't do it to you. And I, I was startled to hear that. And to be honest with you, I was angry because the pain was so bad. I wanted to rip the bandaid off and be done. I couldn't stand anymore. I've been dealing with this for six months, but the moment he said that, and I, you know, I trust my dad, you know, he's never led me wrong. I trust my dad. And when he said that, the weight, I felt it just grab me like you're not get letting go yet. And I wanted to let go. So there was this, tur just this tugging in there, this spiritual struggle of do I stay, do I leave? So that was a very big turning point, hearing him say that. If he would have said, yeah, I think you need to get divorced, we probably wouldn't be sitting here today because his opinion weighed heavily in some of my decisions. Well, let me interject here too to say, on my side of it and what I was going through at the time, I knew, okay, I had told him about the first two and he, even though I was done with the third, I haven't had anything to do with the third in months. I knew I still had to tell him and I wanted to, I wanted to. So after I got saved, I prayed every day. I said, Lord, please open the opportunity for me to tell him about the third. Whenever, whenever you feel it's right for me to tell him, I will tell him. If he asks me, I will tell him because I had, you got to realize we, this is months and months of pain and crying and fighting. And I thought if I put any more on this man, he's going to explode. And so I just knew Lord in your timing, I'm going to tell him. And I promise you, if you open up this opportunity, I will tell him. And so I just prayed about that. And I knew that the Lord's timing was perfect on this because I feel if I would have told him on October 2nd, even though I just got saved, of course, he probably thinks, yeah, sure, you got saved. You just had a third fair that you didn't tell me about. You see what I'm saying? But I think time had to go by for Jason to see the true transformation that the Lord had done in my life so he could accept this information. Though it was difficult and though he almost divorced me, I think he had to see the transformation for a period of time before he could handle this next truth bomb, if that makes sense because it, the timing was perfect. And it was like, it, it was like we started 2015 fresh because it all happened in 2014. We let it all out in 2014 yeah. because that was on New Year's Eve. And then New Year's day, we started fresh when we got home uh, from, from um, when we were still, we were still living in Lebanon, but we were down here with his parents. Yeah, a, a, a clean slate going into 2015. And, and man, it just That's sounds right. like the Holy Spirit came upon you in that moment there, Shannon, and just said, mm -hmm. I'm done. Like, I've I've got to just be open with this. And man, how freeing is that, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, it hurts. It, it sucks to have to do that, right? But like the freedom that comes with just like, here it is. This, this is That's everything. Right. I'm no longer hiding everything. Once we do that, anyone listening to this who is hiding something, uh, just, you know, withholding something from the people in your life. Once you are fully open about that, that's where freedom comes from. You know, the truth will set right. you free is what scripture says. And, and so being truthful, being open about what's going on. And as you guys are talking here, I, I, I recall, and I don't know if this was around the same time period, but Jason at the, uh, remnant youth retreat, you brought up a, another very powerful example of 
and I don't, again, I don't know if it was this time frame, but you went to open up the door to leave, but like the door wouldn't open. Can, can you, can you tell yeah. us that story real quick? Cause I, I, I had goosebumps when you shared that at the retreat. So there was three, there was three, and I didn't go into all of them at the, at the retreat, but there was three things that happened where the Holy spirit stepped in in such a dramatic way. Um, when I got back from Southeast Tennessee, I had already told myself, even though my dad had said that, okay. When he told me that I still had so much pain in me that I said, I'm still going to divorce her. Like we fought that night. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we argued and when I say fault, not physical, but you know, we argued that night and I knew when I got back to Lebanon, back to our home that I was going to divorce her. It was over. It was done. So when we came back, she took our children to our neighbors and she explained to them, please keep our children for the weekend. We've got to work through some marital issues. So we spent that entire weekend yelling, screaming, arguing, crying, laughing, loving, hugging, can't stand you, get out of my face. Fighting. Farting, fi fighting. fighting. About, all this stuff was, was just, as you can imagine, I tell everybody it's like the tornado in the Wizard of Oz. It's just going around and you might see a, you might see a goat, you might see a, a cow, you might see a house. You don't, it's just not, you can't make sense of anything. It was yeah. just crazy. Um, but during this time, three separate times, we had a mentor that had helped us kind of, I call triage, kind of stop the bleeding to say, Hey, you guys can make this. So we had spent some time with, with Chris and Lindsay. And the moment I get my clothes, I'm getting ready to walk out the door. All of a sudden my phone dings. Okay. And it was Chris and Chris never texted. Okay. He only waited. I texted him out of the blue. Chris texts me on point at the moment, the second he sends me a scripture at that time. I don't remember what the scripture was. I just remember there was a scripture that was sent to me at that moment um, that really just heavily in, in, influenced me to stop. Don't go out, don't leave, stay. So that happened. We fought more, fought more during this weekend period. The second time I was getting ready to walk out, had my bags and my phone, the Bible app dings. And still today, I was going to show you, still today, I don't know if you can see it. See it. it might be too bright, but it's, it's, um, maybe I'll turn it down. Let's see here. Maybe you can see there's oh, yeah, the scriptures yeah. here and I keep it highlighted because this was, this was the scripture that popped up on my phone. Um, and it's Isaiah 43, 18. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I have made a way in the wilderness and streamed in the wasteland. And that, when that popped up, it was like I started seeing that this was not, this was not just by coincidence. It was God stepping in. So I read that again. I didn't leave. I stayed. And then I'm sitting there and we, we continue to fight. And so the final time when God finally got my attention, I packed my bags. And this is the part you heard. I packed my bags and I'm going out. She's, she's in the living room squalling. She's crying, just blood curdling screams. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. She's crying. I grab my keys. And I go to walk out the door. And when I grabbed the door to open it, it was unlocked. I grabbed the door to open it and I pulled on it. The door didn't open. And I thought, why, wow, man, the door's caught. And I grab it and I pull the door handle down. It's one of those handles that goes down. And I pull it down and I can see the thing in there open it. And I, and I jerk on the door and it was a French door and the door was just doing this. I thought I was going to jerk it off the hinges, as you can imagine, my anger. And I'm pulling the door and I'm jerking the door. And it was like the Lord put his hands on my shoulders and said, sit down. And I remember just taking two steps back, sitting on our on our two on our stairs there, and I just wept. I just cried because I knew that God knew that if I left, I wasn't coming back. And so when He put His arms on me and just made me sit down, I sat there for a while, just crying, and I got straight up. I turned around, I walked back into the bedroom. I remember Shannon was in the living room, still just squalling and crying. And I go back to the middle of the bedroom. And Terry, I get on the middle of our bed 
on my knees. And I had so much pain. I just wanted to die. I had so much pain in me. And I remember looking up. And I started praying. And I just felt like this is this is how it just came out. I just kept feeling like I just had to get this pain out of me. And I just yelled as loud as I could yell, this full surrender, full release. I looked up and I was so angry. And I just said, you want it? You want it, God? You can have it. And that moment was this release to where I really felt like, really felt like I was in the arms of God. Like he just took that from me. And ever since that day, I'm not going to be all spiritual and say that that it's been perfect. It's been this perfect, you know, slide scale. Everything's been great. No, it's been a roller coaster. Okay. But the things that have happened in our lives, and I'll just give you a couple just crazy ones. So we put our house on the market. The very first person that looks at our house buys our house over ask price. We put our house back on, on the market in 2015. We moved down here. Um, we spent a year without a job. And I know somebody says, well, that was, that was an amazing thing. It was an amazing thing because we had zero income and we never missed a payment. We never missed anything. We spent time together restoring our marriage for an entire year. We didn't work. And we just stayed together and worked through this, cried a lot, got therapy, got help, got plugged into our local church here in our town. From there, it has taken off. I'll add this little slight caveat. When I was a young man, we were in church and my grandmother prophesied and it was me and my cousin that was there. And the way the prophecy came out, and this is when I was a young teenager, my grandmother said that one of those two, one of my two son, grandsons here, will end up being in the ministry, will be a will be a minister before he's 40. And so my other cousin is not a minister. And I was turning 40 when we started at this church. Okay. I was 39 when I started back at this church. We end up starting a couples class at this church on Lee University's campus. We started a couples class and it grew and grew and grew. And one day I was sitting there in class teaching and it was like God hit me in the middle of the chest. He said, do you remember the prophecy? And I was like, but I'm not a pastor. He said, but you're ministering. You're a minister. You're ministering to these couples in need. And I was like, yeah, but, but that was so, now I go, oh my gosh, I'm, it was before I was 40. And it was unbelievable to understand that we're, and, and we don't have seminary degrees. No. We don't have anything like that. We have physical education degrees. And our local <laughs> church is on on the campus of a, of the Pentecostal Theological Seminary and Lee University, which is a Christian-based school there. And for them to allow us to teach a class when we're not qualified to do that, it's only a God thing. It's totally a God thing. So as we started this class and it's grow, we've continued to try to help people over the years. Um, I've talked a lot, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. No, just... The Lord's opened so many doors for us, you know, to speak at conferences. We've counseled or mentored over 300 easily, 300 plus couples um, around the world in the past eight years. Um, they did a documentary on our um, local TV station here on our uh, testimony a couple years ago. Um, I've spoken at Bryan College telling my testimony. Um, our testimony was on a billboard in Georgia for five years. I mean, it just goes on and on and on to say that the Lord can take any mess and turn it to his message of grace and mercy and redemption. But people just have to be willing to let go of their selfishness and surrender their life to the Lord, just like I did October 2nd. But it's not easy. You know, it's not easy to do. But when you do it, your life will change dramatically. And if you give your life to the Lord, he will make it into something beautiful that like I literally live a life that I could have only dreamt about. I love life where before all I ever thought about was suicide. I would think driving to school, how, when I was a teacher, how can I crash my car into that phone pole? So I never have to live again. So I went from living or dying to die. Like I could not wait to die to now. I can't wait till my next day comes because I love, every day that I live this life that the Lord's blessed us with that we do not deserve. 
Come Cheerio. on. <laughs> yes. I want to add, I want to add a little something to that. Um, cause I know we're running out of time, but you touched on something earlier. Um, and, and it made me think of a pastor that we really look up to. Um, his, his name's Matt Chandler, um, out of, um, he, he runs the, he's the pastor at the village church in, in Texas. And, uh, Pastor Matt said, um, and I'd encourage anybody to look him up. He, he's phenomenal. The Pastor Matt um, basically tells people, and this is years ago we heard this, and I think it's so powerful. He said when they do their, their uh, baptismal services that he encourages people to share their testimony, just to snip it. You know, I was an alcoholic, but God. You know, I was, I was a drug dealer, but God. You know, and, and, and to... To do that, I was in an affair, you know, if that's if that's what that person does. If they say, well, I was, in, I was in an affair, but God stepped in and saved my life. There's people that's going to hear that that may be in that current situation and be dealing with that current sin. And that just goes back to say, that's what it says in Revelations, where it says you're made an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. The enemy yeah. wants you to stay in secrecy. The yeah. enemy wants you to stay because if you if you don't, when you drag something into the light, it has it loses it loses its, lose its power. So when you have a sin and you confess that sin and you get help and you get accountability and you get people around you, a community of believers, then it loses its power over you. Whether that's pornography, whether that's drugs, whether that's anything, you, you've got to confess that, get it out into the open. But the enemy will tell you, don't tell anybody that because they'll think you're a weirdo. Yep. Don't tell anybody that because they're they're and it's just it's it's a lie straight from the pits of hell. And so what we've learned over this is after sharing our testimony, um, the amount of people that have reached out to us over and over, I mean, literally while we're sitting here, I've gotten texts, people that have reached out to us to, to allow us to be that conduit that the Lord uses to get his word through us. Um, it, it's astronomical. I mean, we've dealt with people from Australia, South Africa, uh, South America, Canada. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. They're just um, looking for hope. Just like we were nine years ago, we just needed to know, can we make it? I mean, we, we, we were trying to just get through five minutes a day and then 10 minutes a day and then 30 minutes a day and then an hour a day. Like you have to take minute by minute because you feel like the life is being sucked out of your lungs. But one, another quick thing, another quick thing that we tell people, um, allowing this full surrender to where, and we had everything out of whack. The way that God, and you can't get out of the second chapter of Genesis before you realize that God, when he created us, it was supposed to be our relationship, individual relationship with Christ. And then second to that, and, all, and, and, and I mean, second, literally second from our relationship with Christ is our relationship as a spouse. And then our children underneath that and everything else falls below that. Okay. When you get job up here or when you put children above your marriage, we were just working with a couple last night that said they're... They had problems. One of the contributing factors was that their child the was sleeping in bed, bed with them all the time. And I'm not talking about an infant that needed a little. I'm talking about grow, a child that needed to go to their bed. But and then we dealt with another couple this week that that from the moment the child was young all the way till they were 19, that she put the the uh, the above. child above her marriage, above her relation. And so when we get all these things out of whack, just like I put job above our marriage. When we don't do it the way that God outlines it, there's going to be problems yep. because marriage is instituted by God and no one else. And so that, there's just so many things that we try to tell people, and, and we're just giving you a snippet now. But we would encourage people, get plugged into a, a, a local church, someone that has the resources. Um, I'm not knocking little churches. I'm sure there's great small churches out there. But wherever you go, make sure there's resources there for you to have a strong marriage Someone there, accountability, Christian, even it says there's there's, there's a, a wisdom and a multitude of counselors. Having good Christian um, counselors and, and, and folks around you to, to be a support staff um, helps you be more accountable, helps you grow in your spiritual walk. Um, but seeing our children now thrive is mm -hmm. unbelievable. How we broke yeah. this generational sin. We're not Our children are not going to carry that into nope. their future. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And we're so grateful for what all the Lord's done in our life. And, and uh, man, I, I, I've, I, I, I'm kind of speechless, as, as you can tell right now. Just I'm overwhelmed at the goodness of God in your guys' story. I mean, 
there is no reason other than him that you that you guys should be sitting here together talking to me, right? I mean, with everything that right. we just okay. talked about, this is all because of him. And man, like you said, now your two daughters are gonna grow up um, knowing what a healthy marriage looks like, knowing what the right hierarchy is to have in a marriage. And man, I, I talk about that a lot with my clients too. You know, that hierarchy, it's gotta be God, spouse, then children, and things will always go to chaos if that's out of order. And man, um, I haven't met your children, but you know, I follow you guys online. It uh, looks like they're, they're both tremendous young ladies of the Lord, both very gifted musically. And we talked about that at the retreat where who knows where that came from? Cause neither one of you guys got, got the music bones in your body. So Thank praise God Lord. for that. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. One, one question that I had for you guys before we, we really wrap this up. So often when I'm working with couples that are on the brink of divorce, that there's been sin in their marriage, adultery, whatever, they always ask, how, how can I ever trust this person again? I'm curious to hear from you guys. How did you guys rebuild trust? You know, maybe even specifically for you, Jason, you know, how did you learn to trust Shannon again after she came clean with the affairs and, you know, even for Shannon, how did you learn to trust Jason that, Hey, like he will keep you, you know, second to God. It's not going to be work anymore. It's not going to be money. It's going to be you. How did you guys rebuild trust in your marriage? Yeah, it's extremely slow process. Uh, when we, when we mentor couples now, uh, they may be three days into finding out about affairs. They may be two months into finding out about affairs. And, and quite often we hear, I, I've forgiven my spouse. Uh, and, and I'm fine. I'll, I'll get over it. It's fine. And I'm just like, slow down, slow down. There's stages of grief. There's stages of, of building back trust and setting up boundaries. So it takes a long period of time is what I want people to understand. Just because you're still angry after two, three, four, six months, it took me basically seven years, okay, to where I finally wasn't thinking about it every day um, and, and, and to where we could get past that and grow. But how did we do it? First off, I watched her life, okay? I saw her life and I saw the fruit of the spirit in her. I saw the gentleness, the meekness, the kindness, okay, the self-control. I saw all these things. I saw her, her language change. I saw her heart change, the gentleness and kindness toward our children, the selflessness that she has, the, um, the way that she dresses, the way that she, there'll be more, maybe days I don't really want to go to church or something. And she's like, no, no, let's go, you know, and, and, and being that, that person carrying that, that gauntlet, you know, carrying the torch or whatever for our family. I see that I watched that grow in her. Okay. So that's, that was huge in us starting to build trust. If I would have continued to see the same person, I would have known that there was not a transformative thing that happened in her life. So I saw her walk, walk out her faith. Um, and so that was hugely helpful with that being said, because of the trauma and even me being diagnosed with PTSD from this, um, what, and I'm fine now, but I'm saying back then when we were first going through watching, watching her do all these things, like I said, from, from a spiritual standpoint, um, and then me being diagnosed with the PTSD, um, putting boundaries in place. Okay. We tell all the people that there should be no passwords that the spouse doesn't know. We use life 360 app on our phone to where we know where everybody's at at all times. We have a standing rule, rule, and this can all be specific to each couple, okay, and their needs and desires. But I have, a, I have a standing rule. If I call Shannon, answer the phone. I don't care where you're at, answer the phone. I just need to know that she answers the phone. For some reason, it, it makes me feel good knowing that she can hear me because there were some trauma and triggers that happened there whenever she would turn her phone off and I would, couldn't get a hold of her and she was with the affair partner. So we have worked out a system for us to where there are boundaries in place. I never, I'm a realtor. So a lot of bankers want to go out and eat lunch with me because that's how they make their money. I send them clients to, to sell loans to, um, I get that, I get that opportunity all the time. And we made a rule from the beginning. We don't go out and eat with the opposite sex without both of us being there. So if a female wants to go out and eat lunch with me, I will not do it unless my wife's with me. Okay. I don't have to go tell them all of that. I may just have something else to do at the moment. Cause nobody needs to know all that, you know, <laughs> all that periphery. But basically if she's going to go somewhere with a guy or something or have to be somewhere with her business, I'm there. Okay. Um, so we have boundaries in place and there's a good series for your listeners. 
um, uh, guardrails by Andy Stanley. Um, and it, guardrails are not there to keep you from doing something. They're there to protect you from something. And so the moment you set these guardrails, um, you may go over and bounce off of them, but you're protected. So there's just, that's a great series. Again, it's Andy Stanley guardrails. I would encourage everybody to listen to that uh, series. It's great for classes and stuff at your church as well. But, um, but yeah, boundaries was huge in building back trust, uh, trust and verify. So yes, I trust her, but I'm just going to verify. I'm going to check the phone records. Okay. I'm going to make, and then when I find out that there's nothing there, then guess what? I feel better. Okay. And it that's, builds the trust even more and more. Every time he checks it and doesn't see anything, the trust just builds. Yes. So that's, a, that's a few quick examples of the way that we have built back trust over time. Um, well, I know for me, um, I know we didn't get into the, even the pornography issue, but after I told him about the affairs and we were trying to clean the slate for 2015, he ended up telling me that he, I, I had a feeling that he had watched pornography for many years. And I asked him and I asked him and I asked him and for years, for seven years, he lied to me and said, no, I haven't. Well, then it came out that he was watching pornography. And so that was hard to trust him again. He took his phone in the bathroom. He took his phone, you know, into the bedroom. So I had a lot of issues there thinking that he was watching pornography again and probably even more now that I told him about I had affairs. So I thought he was going to kind of try to get back with me with the pornography. Get so back at you. Yeah. So that, that kind of, you know, that was a little bit of a struggle, but anytime I ever want to see his phone, he lets me see it, you know, and stuff. And we had the covenant eyes on there for a while. Um, and so that helped a lot, but I still do struggle. I'm not going to lie. I still do struggle with his working too much because for me, that's my PTSD because I've lived with that since we got married. And so work, 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 money, money, money. Well, that's from my past. And so that's a struggle for me. And I think it probably will be till the day I die because he is so addicted to work. And so him, I mean, even after we went through all this, he still didn't stop working even when we moved here. He was a real, he is a realtor, but he was really busy real estate and his phone would ring like 200 times a day and still never spend time with me. And so I had a lot of those triggers come up again, going up. He still didn't learn even after three affairs, he still didn't learn that he's working too much. So that I don't have an answer for because I still struggle with it. Sure. Sure. No, I appreciate the, the, you know, just you guys being candid with that and being real. Um, you know, obviously God is all over this, but no marriage is, is perfect. Right. And, and, you know, it's that process of sanctification and even the process of healing, like that's a daily thing, you know, um, sometimes healing is instantaneous, you know, like, you know, God will perform a miracle where cancer is gone, you know, stuff like that. Other times healing is a process that, that can only be walked out hand in hand with the Lord day by day. Right. And you guys are a shining example of walking with the Lord. You know, I, 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 even as we're talking, I just see a picture of, you know, Jesus in the middle of you guys, each of you guys has, you know, holding one of his hand, you guys just walking together. It's, it's incredible what, what he has done. And I I'm blown away. Honestly, I am absolutely blown away at your guys' story. Uh, legit, probably one of my favorite stories that I've heard, one of my favorite testimonies that I've heard. And um, all, all glory to God for it. And as you know, I guess my final question for you guys, as, as you reflect back on everything we talked about and you think about the goodness of God through it all, what comes to mind about the goodness of God? For me, I know this is my situation. Um, the goodness of God is, is undeserving grace and mercy and freedom. Those, those are my those are my words and how I take it in my, in our situation. What about you? The goodness of God has allowed me to see how messed up that I really am and even was at that time. Um, and how we need God so much in every aspect of our life, because if I didn't have God in me, I don't think I could have been a very good forgiver. I don't think I could have offered the grace and mercy, but when God imparts his Holy Spirit in us, it allows us to give grace and mercy because I tell everybody I could easily be caught up in that same situation. I could have been in an affair and I would, I would be begging for grace and mercy, 
and but we can only typically see it from one side. So just understanding how God's been so good and seeing his faithfulness and how he's blessed us. We own this beautiful farm and our businesses are growing. And, you know, I'm one of the top realtors in Southeast Tennessee and her, she's got this amazing woman owned, created from the ground up business. That's crazy huge here in Southeast Tennessee. And when I see all that, I think from two people who tried their best to mess this up. Yeah. If that's not the goodness of God and his grace and mercy in our life, it's, it's unbelievable just to see what all he's done in our life. We're so, I tell our so girls undeserving. all the time, our girls are very accomplished musicians. Um, and without going into all of that, sometimes, you know, they're teenagers and they're literally phenomenal. Um, matter of fact, our, our daughter who's 12, um, uh, just, just turned 13. She is our, our musician at our, she is our drummer at our church and our church has over a thousand people in it and it's on a, on a university campus. And she's 13 and she's the full-time drummer and just seeing how God has just done things in her life and in our other daughter's life. When I hear them sometimes, and I love this because I feel like God really puts this on my heart and I see it now. I see it like when God placed, placed, um, mantles on people and, 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 and blessed families in the, in the scripture. But I, our daughters won't have sometimes have confidence and they'll say, but I'm not a very good singer. I'm not, I can't do this. I can't do that. And I'll stop them. And I'll go, do you not understand? Just like this scripture in Isaiah 43, where God told me, do you not see, do you not perceive what I'm doing? I'm making ways in the, in the, in the streams and streams in the wasteland and in a way in the wilderness. And I tell them, God promised me on January the 1st, 2015, that he was going to do amazing things in our life. Give it to him. I'll handle it. I give it to him. He'll handle it. And when he said that to me ever since then, Terry, it has just been literally unbelievable fairy tale in our life. Mm -hmm. And I tell the girls, wear that, wear that badge. I don't understand sometimes why God has placed favor upon our life, but I said he has. So walk boldly into that with confidence. That's what I tell our girls. Walk boldly into that with confidence. This can happen for anybody, but it has to become right. a full surrender of God. But when we talk about goodness of God, that's what I see. I see that beautiful picture that God's provided us. Amen. And it's hard to see at first. It's hard to see when you're in the mess because you think there's no way this is ever going to be redeemed. There's no way this is going ever going to be restored and that he's going to do all these things for us. But he did. And we're living proof that he did. You are. You, you, you guys absolutely are. And I, I can't think of a better couple to, to mentor any couple, any marriage that's going through struggles that's going through problems. And so how can people get in touch with you guys? If, if they want you guys to mentor them, if you, if, if they're wanting you guys to just kind of walk with them as they navigate through their struggles, how can they get in touch with you guys? Yeah. So we share a Facebook page. That's another boundary that we have set up in our marriage. Um, that way, if we get contacted by a woman, we both see it. If we get contacted by a man, we both see it. So our Facebook page is Shannon dash Jason, right? Um, that they can, you know, Shannon, Shannon, Jason, right on Facebook. Um, and then, you know, just message us through that. And we're, that's basically how we do it. And then we'll, we'll zoom or Skype, you know, or whatever, just like this, um, with couples that are, you know, out of state. And then of course, local couples here, we, we tell them to come to our class that we teach on Wednesday nights for on marriage. And, and full disclosure, we have to say this, we're, we're not licensed counselors. Yeah. Terry, we are mentors. So we share our experience and what we've learned throughout this with people. We don't claim to be counselors by no yeah. means. Uh, we've just, yep. we're just conduit allowing God to use us. Right. Well, and, and, and God is using you. He's using both of you guys in powerful ways. I will link your Facebook account in the show notes so people yep. can find it and, and reach out to you. You guys have been super gracious with your time. Thank you so much. This is this has honestly been just incredible. And I'm so glad God crossed our paths there in uh, Tennessee on that hot August night. And uh, <laughs> I look forward to to staying in touch with you guys and just continuing to, to follow you guys and see how the Lord continues to use you and your story to set the captives free and to bring freedom to people. Thank you, Terry. We're so excited that you had asked us to do that. And we're yeah. so thankful. And we ask that Lord blesses your, continues to bless your ministry with this podcast yeah. and that you continue to be a, 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 a weapon the kingdom can use to defeat the devil. So I get it. That's wonderful. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank, Thank you, Terry. You. We really appreciate it.